So anytime I transition my diet where I'm trying to make, and not just intuitive eating or trying to stay balanced, but I'm trying to make moves. I'm trying to lean out or I'm trying to bulk up. If I, if I shift uh, my diet in one direction or the other, I also like to shift the stimulus. I also like to just shift. Just to maximize the change. Yeah, the program. Yeah. Just so, exactly. So you maximize. So you, especially after you've been doing this for a really long time, the, sh the shifts are so subtle and the gains are so subtle that anything I can do to accelerate, I'm going to do those things. And one of those ways is sending a novel signal while also changing yeah, the Yeah, initially I think I misunderstood what your point was. But yeah, I think um, for sure a lot of people misunderstand the fact that you're trying to preserve muscle in, in a cut yep. instead of just trying to hustle to burn calories and lose weight, right? Uh, which is the common... A thought process when yes. when they're navigating towards what program to do and like how to pair their nutrition and all that to it it's like how can i get all this off of me uh instead of, of really focusing on still strength training still providing like a muscle building type programming but now we're just adjusting our nutrition hey here's the giveaway the rgb <laughs> bundle maps anabolic maps performance Maps Aesthetic. We're going to give that away for free. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to the RGB bundle. Also, one day left for the huge sale this month. Maps Prime. Maps Prime Pro. Maps Anywhere. Normally would retail for $361. Right now, for the next 24 hours, it's only $99.99. That's it. If you're interested, go to mapsapril.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Whether your goal is to cut or to bulk, you should train to build muscle. It benefits both of those. You know, I think when people are, they change their training based on the, the cutting or bulking goal mm. with their strength training, not realizing that the goal should always be to build muscle, even if you're trying to cut, because at the very least, what it's going to do is it's going to preserve the most muscle mass because it's very difficult to keep muscle as you drop calories. So you want to send a build muscle signal no matter what. So strength training should always be a uh, revolved around that. No this matter reminds what. me a lot of the questions we get all the time about like how to pair the nutrition with the types of programs we yes. have as well. And it's... You know, it, it again. At the end of the day, if you, especially if your goal is to build muscle, like we got to make sure that we're in adequate surplus uh, for that to happen, and giving it proper nutrients. Now, are you are you saying that it, it, at the same time? So, let's say I'm I'm going on a cut. Are you saying that my goal should also to be build muscle with the training? With got it. So that I think there needs to be some clarity. Yes. right? So it's like even though I'm I'm getting ready to go into a a cut, you know, so a calorie deficit for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, the thought process is my programming should be written or I should be following something that is trying to build more muscle on my yes, body. Now, oh, now, I so, now, I know what some people are thinking. They're like, you know, when I go on a cut, what I've heard is when you go on a cut, you do a lot of supersets, you do a lot more reps because it burns more calories. Mm. And I get the rationale, but that's not why I would have somebody do supersets, for no. example. If it's a novel stimulus, whether you're in a bulk of calories uh, or you're in a, in a deficit with calories, it's going to build muscle. So the, the what you want to do is what you want to do to build muscle with your training. Then the diet is what determines whether or not you cut or you bulk because the signal that you send with your strength training is going to at least keep the, mu the muscle the most, <clears throat> right? It's going to keep the muscle the most as you cut your calories. So someone may ask, well, why then do people do supersets and stuff? Well, they think it burns more calories, but there is a psychological benefit. I like to do supersets and higher reps when I cut my calories, not because there's some special fat burning properties to that kind of training. It's the psychological piece. Yeah, because so I have to go lighter. Like a, you don't feel like a wuss because you're having to lift half the weight because you're not as strong. Yes. Yeah, so if yeah. I'm doing supersets, I'm going to go lighter anyway, right? But I've done, you know, five by five type training on a cut as well. It was a novel stimulus. And so I said, I'm going to switch to this style of training to keep muscle while I'm dropping calories. It's the most effective thing. What would make me decide is is 100% what I was doing before yes. I transitioned the cut. That's yes. <clears throat> regardless of, and I agree with you, like the psychological benefits of going lightweight and supersetting and high reps when you're in a cut because you're in a calorie deficit. I think there's a lot of psychological benefits of that. So you, you're not like discouraged every day that you're, like you're getting yeah. weaker and weaker. Um, but that, that would be different if, say, I was just running like let's say a phase three of maps aesthetic which is a lot of supersets high reps right 
So I just come off a map set, and then now I now I'm deciding. Okay, it's I've been running that. Let's say for three or four weeks, and I go. Okay, now I want to start a cut. So if I wanted to start a cut, even though I agree and I like the idea of super and straight, I would move out of that because that's what I was currently in. Yeah. So you get so, a new stimulus, a, a novel stimulus, right? So you would go into like a heavy training phase, that's right. even if you're cutting your calories. That's right. That's right. And so I think that's the the key takeaway for transitioning in and out of, and I like that for going into a bulk. So anytime I transition my diet where I'm trying to make, and not just intuitive eating or trying to stay balanced, but I'm trying to make moves, I'm trying to lean out or I'm trying to bulk up. If I, if I shift uh, my diet in one direction or the other, I also like to shift the stimulus. I also like to shift- Just to maximize the change. Yeah, the program. Yeah. Just so, exactly. So you maximize. So you, especially after you've been doing this for a really long time, the sh the shifts are so subtle and the gains are so subtle that anything I can do to accelerate or make those gains look like they're more, you know, yeah. I'm going to do those things. And one of those ways is sending a novel signal while yeah. also changing yeah, the diet. Yeah, initially I think I misunderstood what your point was. But yeah, I think um, for sure a lot of people- misunderstand the fact that you're trying to preserve muscle in, in a cut yep. uh, instead of just trying to hustle to burn calories and lose weight, right? Uh, which is the common uh, thought process when, yes. when they're navigating towards what program to do and like how to pair their nutrition and all that to it. It's like, how can I get all this off of me uh, instead of, of really focusing on still strength training, still providing like a muscle building type programming, but now we're just adjusting our nutrition to, to be more. On Plus the, the, the side effect of having more muscle, we've, as we said, uh, I don't know, at least a thousand times on the show is a faster metabolism and easier fat loss uh, process. But yeah, if, if you're going on a cut, your goal should be to build muscle with your training. In other words, do training that you know is either novel or, or different enough to where this is going to stimulate some growth. Now you may not, and you probably won't build muscle if you're in a calorie deficit, but because you're sending a build muscle signal, you'll lose less muscle or at best you'll keep what you, what you've built when you go on the cut. And that's the challenge. The challenge is how do I keep my muscle as I get rid of body fat? And the best way to do that is to send a build muscle signal. There is no such thing as a keep muscle signal, right? You either building or you're losing. Right. So build muscle, build muscle, drop the calories, and at the very least, I minimize the amount of muscle. Now, that we're, we're, we're speaking towards rep ranges right now, but this applies to even like, uh, you know, novel stimulus can be different exercises. Totally. Right? Like, so I love mm -hmm. to do both even, right? Okay, I'm going to transition. You know, let's say I, I was running a, a five by five, and then I'm going to transition to a cut. Like a great program to transition into is like, a map strong where the first phase is 20 reps right yeah yes. you got 20 I, i'm going from a five by five type of training and not only am i going to go for like so let's say i'm running five by five anabolic type of style and i go to a cut i'm going to not only transition out of a five by five very traditional type of training i'm going to go to something that's a little more unconventional with different lifts that i'm not used to doing and i'm going to be doing 20 rep range like that's going to be such a novel stimulus that my body is going to start changing i love to do something like that at the same time of, of changing yeah. the diet now mm -hmm. now, th now there are potential psychological benefits from also doing traditional you know, for lack of a better term, strength training or powerlifting style training in a deficit, a calorie deficit. Now, the, the detriment is what I said earlier. It's it's hard to be strong when your calories are low, but your energy also tends to be low. So long rest periods and low reps can sometimes make the workout more bearable. I'm, I've been in some calorie deficits where I'm getting my body fat down below five, you know, five, six percent where your energy just, it's just not great. And I would do, you know, sets of four reps and I'd rest three minutes in between and it was easier. Now I wasn't lifting heavy because my calories were so low, but the rest periods made the workouts, you know, more bearable. So you want to consider that for yourself. Think to yourself, like, what's going to be novel? What's going to stimulate muscle growth or at least preserve muscle? And then my psychology, and this is something that people don't, don't consider enough. Yeah. What messes with me the most when I'm training right. or when I'm cutting or when I'm bulking? For me, bulking never really messed with me because I was a skinny kid, so that's always a good time. Cutting would mess with me a little bit, and if I saw weight on the bar go down, that would screw. I would yeah, it would, would mess get in my head for sure. It would get in my head, and then I'd go up my calories and mess up the whole cut. But if I'm doing right. supersets anyway, I'm not going very heavy, and I stop paying attention to the weight anyway. So it works better for my psychology. It's not because it's I had a, to learn that, and that's really where I do lean more into uh, you know higher rep and hypertrophy uh, style training because it's just. Um, again, I can, uh, 
lift a bit lighter weight, but, but again, get a total novel stimulus that I'm not, um, programming typically, but when I'm in a cut, it fits perfectly. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, along the, the psychology point you're making with this, it's, I think it's important even to talk about like, not just the strength gains that you, you see that you lose sometimes, but also, uh, the way you look. Like uh, that was it. That was the hurdle for me because I I was never the oh, guy that in the beginning. Of I cut. never chased like yeah. PRs early on in my career. That I was never caught up in like my honestly. I wasn't. I didn't care that much about how strong I really was. I didn't. I I cared about how I looked. Um, and what really messed with my head was when I go into a cut. Um, I never would finish it. Or this is early on. I'm talking about right. Um, I would never finish it because I would swear I'm losing so much muscle because I would shrink down so much. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, maybe my waist went in a little bit too, but then like my arms, I felt like my arms got way smaller. My chest got small, all the muscles you that I don't worked. feel as pumped. Yeah. Cause I'm not, you're, you, you gotta understand that like your, your muscle bellies are full of carbohydrates and water and fluid, right? So you have all this fluid and carbohydrates in there. If you deplete, it sucks that out. And if you're a taller, bigger guy, that's going to be a, that's a lot. Right. And so you can, your muscle bellies in the, in the bodybuilding world, we just call it looking flat, mm -hmm. right? Cause you're not filled up with all this. So being in a deficit can cause you to have kind of this flat look for an extended period of time, especially in the beginning yeah. when you're, you're, you're losing some body fat, but it's not enough to give you definition. So you just feel smaller. I used to confer, I used to refer to that as like the, uh, the, the between haircut phase, you know, when you're between haircuts, when yeah. it's just like, or you, it's like that length where it's like, oh, this sucks. Awkward. It's yeah, yeah. It doesn't look good. It's not ready for a cut. It's like the same thing when you're in this cutting weight is, you know, you need to do these things to get to the goal that you yeah. want, but you kind of let your you your mind mess with you a little bit because you don't like the way you're looking. Yet you're heading to a direction you think you want to go to, and so it's a it's a real mind fuck when you don't understand what what's happening. Same and, thing on the reverse. Uh, if you get somebody that's uh, always you know dealt right. with, with you being overweight, put them on a bulk. Uh, yeah, and you and you're like, no, we got to speed up metabolism, put you on a bulk, and and they're like, oh, my legs feel. Yeah. They feel tighter. Yeah, my or clothes I feel, are fitting tighter. I feel bigger. Or, you know, if I would train a female client, her butt would build and she'd be like, my jeans feel tighter. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if I want to keep, I'm going to cut my calories. I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. It's really tough to get through that mental aspect. So that's why I say consider that the most, uh, I would say, with your training. That's the most important thing because that's what keeps you consistent and in the game is that mental aspect, uh, not just, uh, you know, not the objective results uh, necessarily, right? For the, you know, young, insecure guy like I was that cared about the way he looked, this is also why I was drawn to carb cycling so much was because then I'd have this day where I would refeed and it would fill my body back out. And, and reassure I, you. And it would reassure me like, yeah. oh, okay. I, and then I would start, okay, stop looking at my days where I'm in a, a major calorie yeah. deficit and I'm depleted. And let's let's take you know pictures or um, you know, mental pictures, whatever of where I'm at when I refeed and I get my pump, and it's like okay, that I like. But it, the days after following that, when I have to cut again, I didn't like that. So I, that's why I like the carb cycling. So it wasn't like this, you know, consistent yeah. de depletion for a long period, extended period of time. I get to refeed and then kind of see like, oh, okay, this is what I look like when I'm all filled out. Okay, I'm still heading the right direction. I thought I thought that was a really good strategy for that reason. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. So I got to tell you guys something funny that uh, happened the other day with with my 18 month old. So do you guys? So I think this might be a dad thing. So if my son cries over something that is like, I, for lack of a better term, silly, like he's trying to get your attention. Or he's like, you know, whatever. And it's hard not to giggle or laugh. And, you know, Jessica gets mad at me because she's like, don't laugh because he's sad or whatever. But I'm like, he's, you know, he's just doing it because he wants <laughs> like, to. Yeah, it's yeah. over some ridiculous reason. Yeah like, yeah, like he woke up and he was kind of in a bad mood. And then, you know, I'm, I'm getting him food. And he's doing this thing where he's kind of like, oh, kind of, kind of crying. And then I, I kind of laugh a little bit. I'm like, come on, you're okay, right? But then he cries more because I'm doing that. Yeah. So then I'm like trying to feed him. <laughs> and he's like, oh. And then I put the fork next to his face with the food. He's like, oh. And he opens the bell. It's it's yeah, yeah, crying, yeah. I'm sad, but not too sad oh, to eat. Yeah, and I'm feeding him as he's crying, you know. And I'm trying, I'm like, I'm trying so hard not to laugh, you Bro, know. I remember doing that with one of my kids. He was like doing the same thing. It was like, he was like and I, I took the bottom of his jaw and was going, run, 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 run. <laughs> like, like Chewbacca. This is it's it hilarious. A, it's a dad thing, you know. Yeah. But Jessica's like, he's gonna feel, and I, she's right. I get that too. But I'm like, I mean, she's right, but so are you, right? Because Katrina and I have the same battle on this, and I think, I think there's some. Um, there's some value to having levity in a situation like that. Don't you think? Like, yeah. I feel like 
being playful Brand about it and not reacting to every emotional response because they're going to be emotional and react to things yeah. like all the time. And if you're the parent who's always like overly sensitive because they're crying all the time or you or the opposite extreme where you blow them off, yeah. I feel like having some levity around those situations sometimes there's some well, value I think that's to that. Why there's value in having you know two parents that right. balance out, balance it that out. But helpful. Yeah, like like he like the other day he fell. He didn't hurt himself, right? But he fell and he kind of laid there and he looked around and then he saw that like you know we were looking at him. Mm -hmm. So then he's like, mm, you know, doing that thing. And I'm like, oh, you're, you know, you're yeah. fine. And I go and try and tickle him while he's laughing or whatever yeah. or crying. It's funny how quickly they're trained to know that that mom is yeah. the sensitive one and dad is not. And like those, like when Max, anything happens like that with him, he bumps his head. Wow. Like I could be, we could be playing him and I, he bumps his head. He'll get up from me, walk across the house to go find Katrina and, cry. and, and do this. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. cute though, Bro, right? Come on, yeah. No, it's it's, it's, it's have you guys it's ever, adorable when they do. Have you ever seen the video? It's an old video, but there's this kid and he's like uh, he's on the floor, kind of crying or whatever. And so the dad, I think it's the dad or the mom, is recording him, and they walk around the corner into another room, and the kid stops crying, and then they walk around the corner, and then they see the the mom or dad, and they fall back down. Ah! And they did that like three or four times you know, around the house. I'm on you, bro. Yeah. I'm on you. Dude, I can't figure out, and maybe one of our listeners has, has gone through this with their kid, but the, Max is going through this really weird phase that we just, it, like I, I thought it was going to be short, but we're going on now, I think, a month of him consistently every single night. Dude, he's doing this wraps himself in the i mean we've got now we got rid of the comforter we're now stripping him down to just like his his diaper and either a shirt or his pants that's it but as soon as we walk out he makes like a tent and covers himself and, and, and he falls asleep in like the tent and because he's breathing underneath there and, and hot, the room's nice and cool so he's cold if he's outside the sheets but then he gets under there and he heats it all up and then he falls asleep and then i have to go in like 15 minutes later to pull it off and he's drenched in sweat Every yeah. night right now, every night I have to go in there. And right now what Katrina yeah, and I are trying one. to perfect is. Yeah. Like, what do you do? Yeah, well, exactly. What do we, so the, the, the best strategy we have <laughs> holes is, <of> the sheet. <laughs> is knowing when he falls asleep, like, first of all, one waiting till he's completely asleep. Cause I don't want to go in there when he's still trying to go to sleep yeah. and then do that. Cause then it just disrupts him and he's up. So I got to wait till he's out, but I can't let him be out for too long because once he's under that sheet for 20, 30 minutes, he starts to sweat. So we're like well, having to watch the monitor. Like, is he out? Okay, he's not moving. He's not. Go in there. And I go in you there. You do? And, put, and I, put the sheets on the, like, put him in bed, but tuck the sheets in so tight that he can't pull them up, you know? So he's just kind of like a little sardine. I mean, what he does is he go, <laughs> he, he burrows his way under. Oh, so I'll come in there and he's all the way at one corner. He'll do whatever he can to get underneath the sheets. Kids and then are interesting. It's yeah. so, and you know, I've been around kids my whole life and I've just never seen this before. Yeah, I seen that before. It's the sure. weird, it's the weird, and he's not crying or anything. Yeah. It's just, he thinks it's funny. Makes I, him feel safe. I, maybe? I, yeah, it's it's got to be soothing. Like, cause yeah. Aurelius does this thing where I'll put him down and I'll put the, like a, a teddy bear next to him, whatever. And he'll lay there and I'll leave the room. And then what he does is he, he, on the mattress, he'll like do this. He'll start like head banging on the mattress with his head. Dush, dush, dush. I'm like, what is he doing? Yeah. And he puts himself to sleep like that. I'm like, dude, put some pillows around him. Make sure he doesn't hit anything. It's like, what? You know, I but, wonder about that. Cause they have those gravity, the heavy blankets. Some mm -hmm. people really love that just cause of like the, the pressure. So we have like, one of those. Yeah. So we have one of those too. Like, so he's got that and it's, you know, I so I've been playing this game with him since he was little. I mean, of course, Katrina blames it on me, right? So I've been <laughs> yeah. uh, right. That's how it works in every yep. relationship. Is that any bad behavior? So it's like, it's this. somebody's yeah. fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You taught him this. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying I play all games. Yeah, so all I got I, that I, from I, your dad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I love. I I started a long time ago where I, I get the blanket <laughs> and I tell him, "Come on, hide, <laughs> hide, let's hide." And then we get uh, under the blanket, and so it's like his favorite thing to do. And it he is love, and we keep up. We keep a big blanket on the the love sack, and that's part of I part of my routine. I come in the house, wash my hands, go to the bathroom, and then he's normally down there. And right away, he wants to wrestle. We always end up on the love sack. If we land on the love sack, he knows right away. Grab the blanket, and he wants to hide. And then he just likes to play underneath the blanket. Him and I, you know, mm -hmm. and we're wrestling and tickling and doing talking and doing our thing or reading books under there. Like he loves to hide under the blanket, and so. But it's never made its way into bedtime. It's always been this kind of playful time that we, him and I do, and we and we love to do it. And then just recently, it's become this thing that he does on his own when he's in there. And it was cute and funny the first time, but it's like, oh shit, he's doing this every night now. And it's 
causing him to be like soaked. I go in there and I had yeah. to like strip all the clothes off of him because he's and I'm like, buddy, maybe he's found you, Narnia in there. What are you yeah, doing, you buddy? <laughs> it's like, he's, he's like, oh, it's so hot. Why do you like that? Yeah. Just, Kids are well, hilarious. Yeah, yeah, random. Did your son do this too when they're little and you like you're changing their diaper or whatever? And if you like turn away or whatever, they run away oh, and they're yeah. just naked running yeah. through the house. It's the funniest thing. I ever. let him do that. Katrina gets mad. That's another thing Katrina gets on to me about. Just, it's I the funny dude. I think it's the funniest thing I, too. Like a, a one and a half or two year old running around. I chase him. Butt, naked butt, naked butt, naked butt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Then I chase him around the house, and she's like, "He's gonna piss on the carpet. Yeah. And he's gonna <laughs> clean it." Yeah. Has he done that yet? Has yeah, he figured yeah, out how yeah. to do that? One of the, in fact, one of the first times that she was getting on to me about that, and I'm like, "Ah, oh, he's fine." I like came around the corner, and he's standing there holding his dick, just on the, just, on yeah. the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mommy's right. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I had, a, I had a buddy who his son uh, <clears throat> he tried was trying to draw like circles and triangles on the carpet with his pee. Wow. Yeah. And so his dad was like upset. He's an artist. And impressed. Yeah. yeah. He's like, ah, uh, I don't know. That's not bad, buddy. We yeah. um we just had to, I told you guys a lot, like he was sick last week and he did like the whole vomiting thing and he was, yeah. he, he said I was sorry and everything like that. So when we did that, I stripped everything, obviously stripped our bed down and I uh, cleaned, by the way, the, um, the Uller mat is so easy to, to clean and stuff. But since I was doing that anyways, I didn't know that um, there's like, uh, you can use either side of the Uller pad. And you flip it? Yeah, yeah. And the side I was using is the side that it looks like that's the way it's supposed to go. But the opposite side, they say, if you want it to get cooler to use faster to use that side. What? Yeah. So it's the reverse. I didn't know it that. It looks I upside down. I didn't know that either. I can't remember where I read it or do you how know what, it. By the way, do you know what the best temperature for sleep is? I've just, I, I've been looking I, up like- I can think of gas. Can I guess? I would, uh, 57. 62. 65. Oh, is it? Uh, 60, like for most people, of course, there's going to be, you know, variants or whatever, but 65, <laughs> they've identified as 65 degrees in the room generally produces the best REM sleep and, re, and, and consistent sleep. Is well, that right there? I yeah. just know that's my number. So yeah, is that where like, you like yeah, to be? Yeah, I like 65 I like Ideal so for me. What do you guys, set, you go even lower do you guys set your chili? Your, the lowest. Your to? I think 55 or 52 is the lowest it goes. I yeah. go all the way to the all I the way usually to do it like on the super low and then it uh, as before bad, I kind of bring it up. Have you guys, I asked you this before and I think you, one of you guys started doing this. Have you done it where you get it to slowly warm up yeah. to wake you up? I, no, I haven't program done that. that. I feel like it would make me need to pee. Like real bad. Well, it just wakes you up. What are you afraid of peeing in your bed? I will pee before I even get there. Oh, my yeah, bad. Just, yeah. you know, no, I, I sensitive. Like well, that. I even like I like <laughs> okay, it too Justin. for like weekends when I don't <laughs> have to get out laundry. of my bed right away, and it's nice to kind of lay around and it's actually warm in the in the bed. So uh, it does wake you up though. Oh yeah, no, it definitely. Does. I yeah. mean, I wake up if if I get if I go up a degree, I'm like I'm so we didn't have the 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 pad on there for a couple of days while I was washing and stuff and so i had the doors open i left the room one night and katrina was like you left last night well, the door was open it was i was like yeah it still got hot hun she's like jesus i was freezing how are you hot i'm like it doesn't take much where for were me to- we where we shared oh we were in just, we just arizona recently, yeah just recently what an asshole bro we what? get in no we get into the, the well, you the, guys shared he, room? what do you no, mean no, it's the first thing you do when you get into a hotel you turn the ac on hold on a second hold on a second first of all <laughs> there were two rooms it's actually a big place and there okay. were like two rooms yeah but we go in there and the ac's already blowing it's already cold as hell in there okay so i didn't even think twice it's already on so i go in and i unload my bag and you know change you know into some different clothes because we're going to go to the event or whatever and I'm like, damn, dude, this AC is still going, whatever. So we leave, we do the event, we come back. And I'm like, holy, it is cold in here. <laughs> and then I looked at I looked at Adam I'm like, did you turn the thing down? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he turned it on Arctic. Bro, he put it, he put it to the coldest. I do. I, when I go to hotels, I yeah. put it the lowest it will go. It's and ridiculous. Some are, some are, some uh, will let you go down to 50. For that too. I, I know. Similar. And maybe that's what it is too, because I can't do it at home. Yeah. I can't run the house that cold at home because Katrina doesn't like it that cold. And so I only, I do. So I'm in Arizona. So bro, yeah. I'm in Arizona. I'm like, I have to put like a sweatshirt on to go to bed. This <laughs> 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 is too much, dude. Oh yeah. Bro. What is going on? Yeah. I just, I mean, I, sl- I so I like, like, because, you know, her argument or like she always says back, well, why don't you just sleep with just a sheet? I've never, I, I mean, I'm like the gravity blanket guy. I like a little bit of weight. Yeah, you don't want, the monsters get you if you don't have Yeah, maybe that's exactly, what it is. Yeah. I'm not sure what it a is. A thin sheet, the what. monster gets Bro, right through Courtney it. still makes fun of me for having to have the, the closet door closed. Like, I, I refuse to have any doors open. Really? Yeah. You don't like, the, the, the monsters spirit? are going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah like, <laughs> and what you know like that yeah there's a fear there i don't like my feet being out. sorry i don't like my feet being outside the sheet either yeah if my feet I are outside that. the sheet oh no actually yeah i can't have them like 
pin. No, 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 no. You know, no, but down, like, I don't like I'm not covered. Because yeah, you have to it, have them covered. Yeah, yeah like something's going to touch my feet. What's going to happen? That's here? right. Yeah. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, did you guys hear about the oldest person in the world? Just oh, yeah, away. 119, right? 119. That's crazy. Is that a record? Old. Or like, so it gets weird, right? Because there's so oh, the cultures that, yeah. that claim like certain people, but they don't have like real documents of their birth and, and all of that. So it's like, they're just kind of guessing. Isn't that like the DR and stuff like that, that they're like that? Cause there's, there's like baseball players that used yeah. to, that used to, they used to come over and people would be like, well, he's not like 16 tribes. years old. Yeah. He's like 25. Exactly. He's got full beard. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, he's, dude, like, he's, a, he's the, to play. the, the, the uh, elementary high school, the elementary yeah. like champion or yeah. like that. And you look at him. And then and he's they like, beat the crap out of all the yeah, little leaguers. He's like that, 220. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, they're like, no, 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 this is, she was, she was documented, right? So Japan, has good birth records and stuff. So, because you're right, there's a lot that are like, oh, they're 120, 135. And it's like, right. Where's the documentation? Let's verify that. But this 119 years old. So she was born That's in crazy. 1903. So let's just consider real quick, like uh, what she's seen. So wisdom. much world history she's bro, gone through. Bro, first of all, 1903. Maybe Doug, you can look this up. Was Japan operating or, as like were they feudalistic in 1903? Like. Because I know they went through like, a period like of samurai and all that still. Like, well, they went through a period of modernization that that made them more, I guess, quote unquote, Western. But yeah. before that, it was very different, and they were run very differently. So I'd love to see what it looked like in 1903. But she saw, the you know, she saw several pan like crazy pandemics, right? Yes. Flu pandemics. She saw World War One, World War Two, the Great Depression. Like went through all this stuff and was. Crazy to see all that stuff. So feudalism stopped in Japan in 1871. Oh, okay, okay. So she was she, after, when she was alive, it was gone. But still, very different world. In now, do, uh, you know, I, I don't know how she got this. So, yeah, yeah. did you look? At, I mean, when I, when I hear something like that, because there's there's some people that I would never want to live that long. I would. I mean, so long as I have my health. Yeah. Right, like I would not want to be. You don't uh, want to hooked up to a machine. Yeah, I wouldn't really. want to be hooked up to a machine and bedridden for 20 of those. You know, 20 yeah. of those years. That'd be awful. But so, do you know how active she was up until her death? I mean, was she a relatively active well, person, or was she bedridden for many well, years? It says here. So it's what it said about her. This is pretty cool, right? So she, when she was nineteen, she got married and helped run a family business selling sticky rice, udon, and Japanese uh, desserts. She had four kids and adopted a fifth. She loved chocolate and soda. <laughs> that's all I say. In here. <laughs> that's Chocolate they, and soda. That's all we get. That's it. No, no run crazy or anything this. that they no. kind of get. Now idea. the oldest person in the world is 118 years old in France. There's a French nun who's 118, who's now the oldest person in the world. But you know, you yeah. have what you have with someone who lives that long is uh, genetics. Genetics play a oh, massive role. Of course. In that. Yeah. Of course. And they're they, all. By the way, they're always women. By the way, guys don't live. They, they just outlive us for sure. The is that always people, true? I know. The, I know. Generally speaking, it's true. The but it, oldest men in the world live in Sardinia. Sardinia has got the oldest men, but generally speaking, when you get to when you get past ninety, like if you have you guys ever volunteered uh, like a nursing home? Have you guys ever done that mm -hmm. for, as, tra as trainers? Mm -hmm. It's dominated by women. Like almost all women and their old women. And that's right. Like that's like that. Uh, there's a comedy they made about that. Like because the yeah. guy, the one or two guys that are there. Are oh like, yeah, they have like all. all yeah, all, like the, all the women get all excited. <laughs> what movie? What what movie was that, Doug? I feel like you've seen. I mean, that. it was Morgan Freeman. Yes. and uh -huh. uh, yes. Jack Nicholson, I believe. And yeah. uh, who's the guy from Fugitive? What's his name? Oh yeah, oh, he, he's the other guy that's in it. Tommy. He, yes. Oh, Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, Tommy Jones, Lee yeah. Jones. I think yeah. it's those three, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I forget the name of it. By the way, that's true. I I trained a woman who was. Is that her? That's yeah, her. that's her. I mean, she looks pretty good right there. Now, that's 119. That. She looks like she's, uh, I would say, 80s or 90 right it there. It looks like it's 117 when this picture is when taken. When that was taken, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, so, okay, so you guys think that wow. in our lifetime, our generation, do you think we're going to see, that? Is this going to become more more frequent? I mean, and, and how how much more frequent? It depends are we how see? much advanced. I've heard both. I've heard I've heard people say like. It, I heard be, statistically, there's more people living longer today than there ever were. Yes, but extreme age. Yeah, extreme maybe age, I don't know. I don't know because isn't that isn't that what's stretching it out in terms of offsetting the average? Well, what you have now are more less people dying at birth, so that changes the average uh, age of death or All whatever. Right. And people are living longer, generally speaking. However, I've also read that we can expect the 
the uh, the <clears throat> how long people live to start to slow down or or start to go backwards because of obesity and chronic disease. Yeah, but that's because we take it as an average, though, right? Because we're yeah. using I, like I'm more interested in the outliers because I like the I would like to think that we will be some of the outliers of the when you compare us to know. our. Well, peers. Are we going to throw cyborgs in the mix or what? That no, count. Okay. no, no, no. It's just getting be... started is the name of the. Yeah, movie. yeah. I never saw the, that. Yeah, Jack Nicholson wasn't in this one. Oh, okay. I was thinking of Bucket List. Uh, uh, I knew uh, you were on the right track, though. You know, I know you knew what you were talking. By about. the way, this, Morgan Freeman. By right. the way, this is true. I trained uh, an 83 year old woman who she was in a nursing home, and she used to tell me there were two guys. There were two guys in there, uh, in the whole place, and she's like, "Oh yeah, they go, they date." All the That's women. how I think this is. This yeah. is right. I think there's literally two guys, and one of them's the new guy. The third guy is like the new guy, and they're like, "What the? You know?" <laughs> yeah. this is like, this that is- was a 75. I trained a guy that was like 75, and he, he, his whole goal was that he could dance better and like have muscle uh, to kind of show off. And so it, that we just strength trained, and he was just doing it to basically peacock around, yeah. and get attention. Dude, and it worked. The stories that this pe- that they would tell me, like <laughs> like she said, she said she would meet up, they would meet up, and then they'd like take baths together and <laughs> stuff like that. And I'm like, what? You Dude, would, like, you guys naked cool. in the bed? Yeah, I'm naked. <laughs> She's like, no, old I am. I don't care if I'm whatever. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys that's are crazy, great. wild. That's, that's yeah. So, so if you live long enough, like. I don't, yeah. If you don't so get do any not, action so now, you, the longer you live, the more your odds, the better your odds are. So do yeah. you not think our 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 circle of friends are us, right? Like you don't think that what do you think is gonna be our? Are we gonna fall closer to the 80 range or do you think we will land in the hundred? Boy, the advancements in uh, in medicine right now are really interesting and they're really investigating aging the aging uh, process. So yeah. there could be a breakthrough that could get us to the point where we're living, where the average person is living to 120, 130, yeah, which be- would be wild. But you know, we'd have to rewrite so many things. Like right now people retire at, what's the retirement age to get, to get, uh, Social Security, 62? 62 or 65. They're going to have to change that. I mean, they kind of already are. It's becoming more and more popular to, to work as you get older anyway. Well, if you right? live till you're 90 and you're healthy, you, you know, that's like 25, 30 years without yeah. working. That When they set that, by the way, the life expectancy was in its in 60s. So it's like you retire in your last five years, you die, you know, five years in, until you're dead. I, I honestly think the whole idea of retirement is kind of weird anyways. I agree. I, I don't yeah. think, I, the idea I've of- I've been a big fan this of This idea of like, do something you hate for, you know, 30 years of your life so you can then retire and do nothing. And do nothing. Yeah, yeah and do nothing. I think it's such a bad strategy. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if you're going to, if you were, have to do something that you don't like temporarily, during that time, I'm like in pursuit of trying to find things that I want to do for yeah. work. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So like- We'll do an old yeah, man podcast. You maintain podcast. purpose that way. It's like, uh, I yeah, think what, that's the biggest struggle for you. Like watching my dad or somebody else who just retired, uh, you know, not too long ago. It's like just getting them to be energized, to, to go do something. And it's it's totally Dude, both my Both while. my best friend's dads went through like yeah. a little bit of depression, depression. right after. My dad was, yeah. They, my, my dad remodeled. A lot, and, a lot more bickering and fights and he, stuff. He remodeled the house and did stuff to the backyard and like so many times because he's just at home. He didn't know what to do. Yeah. Then I go to the house and my mom's old school. So the house is spotless. But now it's like level 10 because now my dad's, my dad's home and he's like mopping, scrubbing, cleaning. My mom's like, man, he does everything in the house. She's like, he wasn't like this. Before. But it's because he didn't have, he didn't know. She's what, loving know. it. Yeah. But now what he did is he he found a group of friends and they ride their motorcycles together. Mm-hmm. And so now he's got these friends that he goes and they ride with. And now there's good and bad. The good is he's got friends riding motorcycles. The bad is my dad, he likes to go fast. And so he's already had a couple like, you know, close calls or whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, dad, you can't. You can't be racing you, motorcycle, dude. Let's you know, you guys just reminded me talking about like work and, and us potentially working for a longer period of our life with that. There's a lot of companies that are, and we've seen this, we've talked about it on the show before that are trying to reframe how the work week kind of looks. And we just recently got our, you know, our investor email with LMNT. Did you guys see uh, what they're doing? Oh, no. you were talking about that. What What are they doing? So they're, and, and Doug, you can fact check me to make sure. I'm pretty sure this is how it, if I'm understanding it correctly, but they're doing a three, one uh, uh, work cycle. So, so work three, take one off. Work three, take one three off. Three weeks, one week off. What? Wait, is it three weeks, seven days a week? I think so. Wait a minute. And then, but you get a whole week every month of like, so you could go take vacations and you could do like every month. So you work seven days a week. Yes. So 21 days straight. 
and then you take seven days now, off. Now, if I don't, okay, so here's how mm. I feel initially, because I'm trying to think about this. If I don't have kids, I would like that because I, in a week I'll go do stuff. But with yeah, kids, but I like to have those yeah, but days off. Even with the kids, now every every month you could take a week long vacation. Yeah, but them. I'd rather have weekends every week with the kids because of the frequency. You know what I mean? Like three weeks for a kid's a long time to not have like all day with them. You know what I'm saying? That's how I. I mean, I can see what you're saying, but I, I thought it was really interesting. As uh, I haven't heard anybody else doing that. Like we've heard the the so Microsoft all 21 days in a row. So they do. Sunday, yeah, if I believe Saturday, I understood Sunday. it correctly, it was 21 days straight, and then the seventh, this then the next seven days off of completely. Interesting, huh. right? I mean, it's it's worth an experiment, I guess. That's to it. See how it goes. Like I said, if I didn't have kids, I would love that. I yeah. would love oh, it. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, at first I was like, oh, that would suck. Like right away, the first thing I thought was like, man, having to work straight 21. But then again, I was like, you know how many times in my life I've worked 21 days straight? Like oh, a 30, lot. A 30, 40, And every time days. you're on like one of those like little short vacations, like, man, I wish you could have stretched this well, out a and, little bit. And, and, and imagine how easy it would be to grind for 21 days if you knew at the end of that 21 days, you always had a week off. Mm. That'd be really, really interesting, and I, and I, now I'm sure there's productivity would be the one, the main game. Well, that's right? that's what they they think yeah. is they think that they're seeing people are way more productive. Like it takes a couple days to get in the swing of projects, so that that way they can be yeah. focused for 21 days straight that's with weird. no breaks to get and get way ahead, and then they get to take the. I feel week like off. startup companies do that anyway, but they don't take that week break. <laughs> they well, just, oh, they okay, get yeah, in the but zone and they get projects done, but um, then it's burnt. Imagine if you did it like um, what do you? call that where schools do this where they're like everyone's on different tracks so oh, right. imagine if you have 50 employees oh that's what they'd have to do and yeah. they and they they you yeah and it. then they yeah. they're all rotating so as a as a employer you never not have work being done on your business now if you have a partner yeah you just have different segments if you it. have a partner you'd have to have a similar <laughs> schedule right because you have a week off your wife works normal schedule like what are you gonna do oh i guess i'll be you know i'll go on my own somewhere or so I could see how they could have his benefits too. I could see how, yeah. <laughs> say, and that's a bad. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, and the where's the where's the con? So, hey, where's the con? You guys have kids. Where are you going to go? You're going to be at home with the kids. I can go fishing. Yeah. No. All right, listen. You know what I'm this sounds? Yeah. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like it, it's schedule that would attract the single go getter. That's what it sounds like. Sure. I so mean, without so, without saying, I mean, we only want a, single go getters. I mean, LMNT is a startup, so I mean yeah. that that's probably what they're that they want to attract. I do agree with you. It would be a different dynamic to try and figure out for us where we're at yeah. in our lives and with our families. Maybe I wouldn't enjoy it that much. Whatever. Obviously, I would rather have what we have created for ourselves. But you know, if I was working for somebody, like wow, that would be an interesting way to to run my schedule is three weeks on and then one week off like that. I, mean, I wish I had the article, but I did see something along the lines of like Gen Z having a really hard time coming back to work out of all the uh, generations in terms of like the remote working and now coming back. Oh like God. a lot of them, I guess they're having a really hard time pulling that specific demographic back to oh, work. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's so crazy to I me. I mean, come on. Well, they they and that age group hasn't built the consistency of working in the first place. Right. right. I mean, we, yeah, that's true. We, you it's know a what I'm saying? Mentality. So, yeah. They barely just started getting into the, they got into the workforce just a couple of years ago, Yeah, you know, and already within the first five years, they get a, they get a two, two year break. So they, yeah. they've been breaking as much as they've been working. Like, so, breaking is so, way better. So, yeah, so of course it's hard to go back. <laughs> hey, and the government's going to send me a check every couple of weeks. Like <laughs> this whole work thing's whack. Uh, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. Dude. Did you look it up, Doug, to see if they actually publicly announced it? Cause I, maybe it was just something for us investors to get to see. We're not supposed to say it. I think it's, <laughs> Oops. It's an experiment. It is an experiment. Right? Yes. They're going to try it for, well, I think their plan is six month period of time, but if it's not going well, they're going to pull the plug. So I'm so, so we're probably I, not supposed to talk about it. Who knows? Here's my speculation. I don't know. You think here's it's, my think it's private? I look, I love element. I think they're a great company. Obviously we invested in the company because we like them so much, but here's yeah. my speculation. You can't legally say we want young, single, aggressive people working here. You can't say that. Right. What we can do is create a schedule that makes it attractive to them and yeah. not attractive well, to them. Well, companies have been doing this forever, I think. I mean, that's, I mean, that was the- Because like married people with kids, you didn't like, see, I, I don't want You didn't do watch the Amber Crombie doc, did you? I watched half. Okay, so yeah. the part that I was, uh, there was a lot of things in it that was interesting to me, but the part that I thought was so fascinating was they were, I actually thought that um, Google and Netflix and Facebook were the pioneers of the- campus ping pong foosball vibe where you just basically you live, stay there yeah you just want to stay at work all day long 
Uh, Amber Crombie was first to do that. They did? I did not oh, yeah. know that. They this built big, this- Big party uh, community. Yes. I, I didn't know that they did that first. You know what I thought was cool is the way they designed the stores. I didn't even think about this. They put those- Brilliant. Like, those blinds Was that not windows, brilliant? So you can't really see inside. You have so to go just in the curious, store. you know, yeah. Made it feel very people. exclusive. Yeah. And it made you want to come in there. And then they, I mean, God, they, they structure it to have all, all the pretty people at the front that are yeah. talking to you and stuff like that. I thought it was brilliant what they did with the models. Yeah. So all the all the pictures. Well, well, you saw who the CEO favored the most. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I didn't see that. He had, he had a definite uh, type. Uh, that he well, loved. that that so I knew that there was they had some they had some drama like that right that that had came out and I didn't I couldn't remember what it was that's what drew me to the documentary I was, like, I was telling Katrina I was like yeah, yeah. There, no there was some shit with the what was, the founder was doing some well, what was weird was like they tried really hard to whatever they're promoting with the models and in terms of the look and the aesthetic and all that they were trying to mirror that in the stores which you know they could have just had like regular people working in the stores and been just fine you know but he's like trying really hard to like have it like you know the, the same zoolander dudes in there you know, <laughs> so I, I really wanted sal to watch this because i really wanted to, to get into a little bit of a a political talk around it because you know there, there's this this movement of like companies having to be this pressure for companies to be so socially responsible yeah. and really the, you know in from a capitalist view it's your job is to make money and yeah. to be really good at it and allow the market to dictate the market will tell you if you're doing a shitty job right and, and 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 so there was a lot of like outlet like you know backlash from everything that happened with them it's yeah. like I also think that now was it because of the sex appeal that they're selling? That it was, was that. It was all. I mean, it's a lot of like. I guess there was wasn't much diversity, and so then they got so into the preppy that. white kids. Yeah, totally. Was like, that, was they, that was their targeting. That was their target. Did market you see demographic. See how how old the company was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the company was eighteen eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even like, know that. Like, I didn't. That's, I was like, wow, I didn't know this. Company yeah, was and it was it was. Uh, so I mean, he went over to some presidents that were that used to shop there. You Amazon. know what I will say today? It would be the market pressure might not allow something like that, right? So you, you know, in the past, like let's look at airlines for example. Airlines in the past would put these attractive girls in short shorts or dresses as the steward, you know, as the people working in the airplane, and and I don't know if that that wouldn't fly. No pun intended. Today, because people are kind of like, yes, yeah, but I disagree. Cool. I disagree with that. Like, I mean, I mean, not. I don't disagree with your point. But I disagree with why why we make such a big deal about that because it opens the door for somebody else to do the opposite. I'm going right. to be the, air, the airline that's going to be right. super inclusive and let everybody. Well, that's work. exactly. No, I know it's that. Like let the let the companies out compete each well, other. That's what I'm trying to be more like that instead of having to have this homogenized uh, perspective of like how companies should run. No, no, that's no, how I, I thought. This is how I felt yeah. about the Amber Crombie no, thing. No, I agree like, with you. I, what I'm trying to say is, I think the market would respond negatively now because people would highlight that, make a big totally. deal. So I, I think I think it wouldn't work necessarily um, unless it kind of slipped under that's, the radar. To me, the, the, that was the point of bringing this up was because that's the, I think that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. allow, 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 you know, if they're going to be idiots like that. But that is, the that is the market. What do you mean not allow? Was it, were they, did they, were they getting sued? Yeah. Oh, you know, that, oh yeah. yeah. And stupid. to force them, they, they put in all kinds of policies to force them to have to have this diversity. I mean, you have, they hired a department called the, like a diversity executive position. I like, think we and would that be person's job was to create more diversity within the company. There's positions in companies now that that's their job. Yeah. But you know what? That, to make that, sure that they have actually an equal can, balance of yeah. diversity. I get the intent in the sense. To me. So do I. I agree with it, but what happens is you actually create a lot of problems. Yeah, but a better so, way to a better way to do that is go create a company that competes with it and that has all the diversity you yeah, want. Yeah. Right. So like if the, if this company isn't doing it, you think that's unfair and right? Well, go create a company that has that and competes with it, and there will be a lot of people yeah. that that in, especially in today's and age will be like, I want to go with. Them. I think you people would be surprised that the market would probably respond in a way that we would we would expect well, that, it to. And that was the thing I didn't like. I understand like the the most valuable protest to that is to just not put money in that direction. Stop buying the clothes, right. and then like it, you're teaching them a lesson. It's not like they have a monopoly on on you know jeans yeah. and t-shirts. Well, look, back then it was like I mean the market was demanding well, a certain look. Think, think of it this way, right? There was that whole controversy. There was the baker, the Christian baker that didn't want to bake the cake for the gay wedding. And they tried to sue him and pass a law, and I thought that was silly. I'm like, he's he's a baker. It's his he's, it's his work. He can say no to you, and he can be an asshole. Yeah, but by That's the way, okay, by the way, you can be pro gay and still not for that at the same time too. Sure, I understand that. Yeah. I, so I, look, I, I I have no problem. You want to get married and whatever, and I've been to my my friends' weddings who were gay, and it's not a big deal. But it's if he's if he or she is making the cake, and they say I don't want to make it for you for whatever reason, even if it's an asshole reason. 
that's up to them. But I also think that the market today would respond in a way that we would we would expect it to. And what I mean by that is if you allow the bakers to be open, no gay cakes here, they're probably not going to do very well. Of They'll course. serve some well, people, yeah. but they're probably not going to do very well if they're openly like that. You know what I'm saying? I so, 100% agree. So I, yeah. I, I think that that, and I do think that- That's why instead of putting regulations in, causing these 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 yeah. superficial yeah, it positions- It would auto-correct it is my it, thought, yeah. Uh, totally. Yeah, because it, I mean, but it- it was. It was pretty much like on the forefront. It was obvious that, that yeah. you know that was their their demographic, their target. Like they literally had it like outlined, yeah. like specifically what people need to look like, like the whole thing. I, so, I, well, we okay. Like, I, I understand. I think the, I, the experienced, that were I experienced. I experienced this as a gym operator, and this was a, a tough thing, right? Like, okay, when I was a seventeen year old boy looking for a gym membership. I drove there was and there was probably within a 30 minute drive from where I lived, there was probably 20 something gyms. And my buddy and I, we went, we're 17 year old teenage boys. We went around and the thing that made our decision, okay, did it have a basketball court and were the front desk girls hot? Yeah. Like yeah. that was what I was looking for. Now, I know I'm not alone with those criteria for mm -hmm. for buying. So because somebody decides to to appeal to me. By doing that, now they can get in huge trouble for that. Well, Why I also, think I watched Baywatch. <laughs> well, obviously, look, yeah. I also think again, markets now are a little different. Like, I, I wonder how well like Hooters is doing, for example. Like Hooters at one point was probably really popular. Well, sex, I, all, sex always sells. It's, but I bet yeah. you, I bet you, they haven't done as well because it's hmm. not. Well, here's as, my theory: is that I, I, I don't. I would think, love to see that. I don't think. I don't think Amber Crombie dies today. Well, it hasn't. It's still around. I don't think that. It, what would happen is just it would open the door for someone to compete with them because yeah. there's there is okay there's a bunch of people that don't give a shit and like going there and seeing the hot kids that are working there and it is what it is and they're going to continue to shop there mm -hmm. and then there's a group of people that they didn't even think about that that's not important they like the style of the clothes and it opens the door for competitors who are not going to be inclusive yeah. or exclusive and be inclusive and that kid's going to go hey you know what I like what this other brand stands for and they offer competitive clothes just like it I'm now going to shop there so it would open the door for somebody else. I don't think it would kill. Yeah, look at that. It's, it's uh, Hooters is totally in decline. Well, I mean, what I, restaurant is not in decline though right now in the last two years? That's, well, like, that's not a fair. I, I would guess that's a though, 2021 article. Yeah, well, I would guess though that it, it's just you know the find market. Some, the, find us something less biased there. Doug. Markets change and public opinion changes. Right, 30 years ago, going to a restaurant called Hooters with girls, or whatever, not a big deal. <laughs> Today, <laughs> it, it feels kind of cringy, right? Like, what are we doing here? Like, yeah, you don't well, see a lot of Big Johnson T-shirts uh, floating around anymore. Yeah, so those, so, are, those I, are classy, dude. I know, those are classy. I forgot about Please that. I love, the, I love yeah. Big Johnson shirts they, when I was a kid. I can't. I totally forgot about that. I love those. That ones. My mom wouldn't let me have yeah. them. I wanted them so bad. Well, here, speaking. Remember, No Fear and Big Johnson I was do. like the deal. There was the one with the two by four, right? The dude would have the big two. I mean, there's tons oh, of them. Yeah, or like the driver yeah, is the way too big. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, we know what you're doing. All right, so along the lines of regulation and stuff, I don't know if you guys heard this, but uh, the the Department of Homeland Security is now putting together a disinformation governance board, or try. They're they're talking about doing this to make sure that disinformation in social media. You mean to fuck with Elon Musk? Thank I God. That's the real. <laughs> you, mean to, you mean to mess with Elon Musk? Dude, so weird. <laughs> you don't we don't want this. Listen, the number one purveyor of propaganda and target. false information yeah. is the government. That's historically true. Don't you don't want to put them in charge of telling you what is necessarily true and untrue. Yeah. That's not a good idea. It's now, not a good idea. Now, how will this work too cuz I mean, he's What's amazing, what's so great about Who's this deal this board? is that he's taking this from being a publicly traded company to now a private company. Yeah. So what are are those regulations and rules applied to all businesses or is it going to be just towards oh, publicly if, traded? If, it, it's, if it's Department of Homeland Security. It'll be everything. And remember, we pass laws after September 11th that allows these sweeping regulations in the, in the safety of the country, right? Quote, unquote, which opens the door for all kinds of crazy oh, stuff. God. So they could say, hey, this is... This is for for national security. We need to regulate disinformation on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and who's going to determine if it's good or bad information? We are. We're the guys yeah, that you know. We're the people. We know all the things. I do not think yeah. this is a good idea at all. This, this is like when the Rolling Stones hired the the you know uh, uh, was it the Angels to to, oh, to Hell's be the, Angels, yeah. the Hell's Angels to be their security yeah. ended up stabbing somebody or whatever. Uh -huh. Like it's it's gonna it'll be worse. Then if we allow markets and these companies to do that, and that's not going to be perfect, it's still going to exist, 
But oh, you yeah, you don't think that like that's going to get manipulated in 100%. a certain direction? I lie. Dude, humans are biased. You need both sides always. Yes. You, need, you need that conversation like to continuously happen uh, to know what truth is. You don't know what truth is just because I said so. Yeah, no, I no, love no. the fact that they're going to make this so difficult for Elon Musk and he's still going to kick the shit. Out of everybody. Well, I mean, hope so. Je you just watch, Let's, dude. Yeah, the I hope government coming at watch. him. I don't like that. But. He's they're they're going to continue to make it as difficult as they possibly can for him, and he still will watch. He will. If he becomes, if he really becomes a target, there he's done. I, I mean, that's the truth. I, I, they've taken out, yeah. and, and they'll do it in a way to where we won't even we will be supportive of it because I don't. Have a lot so of Business Week did this stupid post. I, I comment on it like it was uh, Nancy Pelosi coming out and like bashing Elon buying Twitter and basically saying I can't believe we're letting this billionaire. She's my favorite. And Business Week, yeah, I know, right? Business Week was you know kind of taking that boy. You should have seen the the comments underneath there. Elon has got a following, man, of people that really, really like. I, I mean. I know we've come off that way, right, of being these massive fans of Elon Musk, but I just, I don't know the guy personally. He I don't. Be, like, for all be, I know, he could be an asshole. Right. Just like, yeah, like again, if he's principled and he he does what he says he he will do, yeah. you don't see that a lot. Listen, I like the shakeup. I like the shakeup. So Look, do I. There, when, okay, there one hundred percent big tech is biased in a direction. It's a fact, and you can look and see where their employees donate. You can see what gets censored and what doesn't get censored. In their defense, though, Sal, I want to make the point that I don't think that's because of their founders, though. Their, uh, Jack no, Dorsey think, was not like that. I don't believe Zuckerberg was like that. Most of these guys are libertarian type of dudes that want employees. free market. I think they've been pressured in that from the loud minority to go in that direction. So, you know, it's kind of and, unfair, and how it's kind of unfair to umbrella like Facebook or Twitter or these, well, these like... Well, look, at, here's, here's what's interesting. Yeah. Twitter sells to Elon. The deal goes through, right? So he's about to buy it. The next couple days, yeah. all these yeah, they're scrambling, all these conservative uh, people on Twitter, all these pages are mysteriously getting fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, half a million new followers, as if shadow banning or their shadow bans got lifted. What I think, when you have eighteen thousand employees, you can't manage all of them. So some of them are gonna they're gonna turn the knob here a little bit, knob there a little bit, based on what they like, what they don't like, make it so that it's not super obvious. I've been shadow banned on Instagram many times and it was weird and nobody could find me like what's going on. So I don't know. I like the fact Did that Did you see my, my Ari post, the video of uh, Ari from uh, uh, Entourage? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It says Elon Musk walking into Twitter the first day. Uh, like it's a, a scene from gun. Ari. He's got the paintball gun and he's just firing everybody. Oh, man. <laughs> that's that's going to be a good time. Oh, I'm, exci I'm excited. I think yeah. it's going to be I do too. fun to watch. Well, that's it's it. hard what? to argue that you haven't seen a complete bias on all platforms. Like It's just, it's just so blatant. Blatantly obvious, and now all of a sudden it's like there may be, uh, you know, a chance to to hear other voices like contribute to the conversation. I just get that's it's so weird to me that people are so adamant to stuff that out. Like obviously it's great when it fits your bias. Uh, well, I know well, this has become very politicized, but I'm at, the part that I am excited about is I mean I just think he's a just brilliant when it comes to building business. I want to watch the business. He's created several like, billion like, dollar businesses. Yeah. And, and yeah. when you, they compared, I, I saw this thing where they compared like, you know, Twitter, Google, and like the average income of the employee and stuff like that. And Twitter compared to all these other tech oh, it was, companies. It was how much revenue per employee was produced. Yeah. And it, like, Twitter was bad. Really bad. Like a bloated company. Wow. And so doing. I can't wait to see how much better he makes look, this company by going in and and freeing up some things just, and doing some real basic smart shit. Look, just yeah. to balance things out so people don't think, uh, you guys are in wonder. I'm going to look, I'll talk about uh, a conservative that really annoyed me recently, which is Governor DeSantis, who is acting very much like an authoritarian. Obviously, Disney. So here's what happened, right? Disney made some political commentary on, on a bill that he passed. So all of a sudden now they're changing their status that it's been in, in, enacted since 1967 to apply pressure yep. on Disney, threatened to sue Twitter because of their, you know, fiduciary duties, is, you know, whatever. This is all political power in an authoritarian way. I don't like that either. And it yeah. open, what it does is when the when the right does it, then the left does it, and then the right does it. And well, you call I don't like it when it's dominated in one direction. Well, you call, no, no, you no, called this a few days other. ago as soon as he did it. The minute it came out and we laughed about it, you said, I don't like it. No. And you said, this is what it's going to stoke is the opposite direction. And you were right. Today, it already came out. The yeah, People are talking about, oh, well, you know who else gets special tax privileges? Churches. 
We need to look at that as well. So what happens is you move the bar yeah. up a little yeah. bit, and, and the go. people on the right, when the bar is moved up in their, on their side, they're cool with it because it's what they want. Yep. And then the left is pissed off. And then it's time for the left to do the same thing, and they move the bar up a little higher. And that's and then we end up yeah. here where the bar is way up here. And it's like like every election now that comes, you know, first it was, oh, the, the Bro, votes weren't counted. So and then it was intense. Russia, yeah. you know, Russia know. collusion. And then Trump, oh, the fake votes or whatever. And it's like every, I mark my words, every election is going to be by the opposite side is going to be called fake for the following four years to, you know, to take the other person down. It's going to be the game. So we have to do call it out. Do you think they'll ever the change uh, the way that we do votes? I hope. I, I, I hope they make that it. That has to evolve in the next, I mean, in our lifetime. It it's kind of crazy that it's been the same machines. Yeah. I, for as long as we have. I tell you what. It's, it's crazy with all the, the technology that we have ar uh, around, you know, cryptocurrency and- uh, Oh, you want blockchain? Yeah, voting? blockchain. Thank you. That's what I wanted. Blockchain, blockchain, like how we haven't figured out how, if we can make that, yeah. that protective and safe, why couldn't we make votes like that right. somehow? Like I, that, that that's, that the capability has to be I'll there. say a very unpopular position. I think we, sh I think voting should be hard. And and here's why, because most people, <laughs> there needs to be steps in the way. Yeah. Most people, I pissed everybody off by saying you should have to pass the test. I think, well, <laughs> think no, you, should, you know why you should have basic fundamental common sense before you get to decide well, because most, on policy. Most people don't, they don't really know and they vote for things that sound good or whatever. And so we make it easier. There's more people who don't know and right, those right. those same people are the people that are easy easily influenced one way or the other, and I don't care which way, left or right. It's yeah. that's what I I I'm in agreement with you. Like I, I'm even okay if I didn't get to vote because maybe I don't do enough. Like I don't so study you enough. Take, you said you have to take a test. I yeah, like I mean that's but then who writes the test? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean of course. I mean you could go down this rabbit hole of yeah. like it could. That's, it's that's here's the, the deal. It could always be corrupt. It could, there's always going to yeah. be people trying to manipulate. There's always going to be evil people. Like there's no, any way you go, it's going to yeah. be like that. I just I do agree that right now the strategy for both left and right is always to gain the populist vote from the people that are easily manipulated yeah. mm -hmm. and they and it's just this battle back and forth or who can get this get this vote and it's like man honestly i'd rather the the people that like actually study all these policies and understand history and economics and like i just don't how like, these things influence us we're making more decisions. i just hate inconsistency it's like you know all you're over here saying it's a it's a private company they can do what they want when you're, it's biased in your direction. Then somebody buys it. You don't agree with them. Now you want regulation right. or, Hey, I don't like it when, you know, government does that and, you know, tries to tell companies. Which, you, and then when it's your side that does it, did you it's like be consistent? Yeah, That's yeah, all. Yeah. Did you watch the most recent all in podcast where they had the guy, the uh, CEO from Coinbase on? No, I didn't see oh, that. Oh, you didn't see that? No. Oh, that was interesting. They talked to him because remember Coinbase was the first company to come out and say no politics, no right? politics. And, you know, he did it after they had already been in business for a while. So there was definitely a little bit of backlash, like they lost employees over it. And it was I bet it's better, though. It is. And that's what he, he's talking about. And so what they were speculating on is that this is going to be the future of company. You're going to have to decide either one, you're e easily influenced by the mob and you're going to go the Disney route. Or you're going to take a stance like Coinbase and say, no politics at work at all. No, like, that's leave it. it at the door. That's it. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how where, where companies- Unless your nose is perfectly clean you, and you're a big <laughs> company, do not take a position because they'll find something on you. Yeah, it'll you know? come back to haunt you. Yeah. Anyway, Justin, I need to ask you, because yeah. I know you're now, you're not a big supplement guy, but I know you've been taking whey protein regularly. Is yeah. this, are you doing this? You're doing which one? The Legion? Legion, yeah. I'm doing the- uh, the the whey protein, the one. Um, what flavor you want? It's a. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> come on, so bro. good. I haven't had that one yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually eating their cookie, their cookie dough cookies. I I think I've come out now, before and said I didn't like their their bars. Yeah, but I, I'm. Do you I just see, do you yeah. just do it with with milk? Because I also add like whole milk, which you know that's a lot of dairy, but I'm I'm all about it. Um, <laughs> just and, like I'm gonna cut. I'm yeah. an almond milk guy. <laughs> yeah, whole, <laughs> whole ice cream. I like to add ice. So now I just start throwing ice in there, blending it it's so much smoother. Like I I was like, why didn't I do that the whole time? Is Stupid. that breakfast? Is that what you do? Yeah, because it usually before I have to go early to train the high school kids, uh, I have to get up a lot earlier. So I, that's my quickest, best option all the time. And I'm trying to get as consistent as possible with eating breakfast. And it's really been paying off. It's given me a lot more energy throughout the day. Th this was my, after Dr. Cabral did our test, right? And that too. Said, yeah. That pissed me off. It was like, in, in this catabolic state, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, fuck, man. Like, <laughs> like you realize 
That's but dude, right. it's like oh, it's all fat jokes, you guys. You know, like, it's like always cutting, all the constant cut. I feel you know? guilty now. I feel <laughs> no, guilty. I don't You're like complex. <laughs> no, was, I just skipped breakfast at one because I was like, oh, I don't need to eat breakfast, and yeah. I'm like a coffee guy, and it just kept driving me like even further throughout the day. Sometimes I miss lunch, and yeah, yeah. I would just got in that habit of I would eat a big meal uh, for dinner for sure, yeah. but then would eat smaller meals. And now I'm like, man, I got to really bump my calories and, and get on top of this. So do you feel stronger? I feel stronger, feel more energetic. Like, yeah, yeah it's so much better. So I I'm can't, like, this is stupid that I haven't been doing this. I, I can't do dairy, but I use their way for, I'll give it to the kids or I'll give it to Jessica and they like it a lot. It's really, really, uh, I don't know, clean. It's, it's yeah, it's clean. It's delicious. Yeah. I've been, I've been meaning to actually tell Mike that he, he really nailed the, the flavor profile on the vanilla flavor. So secretly, um, I've always kept a brand that I've used for a long time for vanilla stuff when I like when I bake with it. And I think I've told you guys this before. Yeah. Like there's I've tried so many different brands and you know, it's splitting hair difference on so many different companies. And the one that I've been drawn to for so long is the one that I felt mixed with food and the flavor profile is the yeah. easiest for me to to create my own stuff. And I actually, for the first time, I actually used his his vanilla way. I haven't used I hadn't used it before, and it was bomb. Probably now, did you make something with it? Yeah, like I always, I make my protein shakes. I'm not a, like just like you straight water almond milk and shake it up and just drink it straight. Like I like the fruit, banana, peanut butter. I use coffee grounds. Like my favorite mix. I think I told it on the show before is with the I actually put real coffee grounds of hazelnut in there. Uh, I do yeah. uh, a banana. I do two tablespoons of peanut butter. And then I blend. Oh, you guys are so oh, funny. You all fancy. Oh, you yeah. guys are so funny. I just, so I'll throw some peanut butter in there. Maybe. Oh, just like, like, I mean, so for me, it's like. You got a couple of kids over here. Well, it's going to taste super good. Mine is normally half. at night. Well, it's, it kind of works twofold for me. I'm like water. Not only is it <laughs> helping me hit my protein intake if I'm Dry low, it. it also gives me that, like, you, you know, my, my ice cream addiction. So it gives me that feeling of like having a milkshake. Have That's, you ever tried making popsicles with it? With I a wonder protein shake. Yeah, like freeze it. You know, like you know, they have those like sticks that you can make with. Yeah, the, yeah, we do. We do for Max all the time. I wonder Katrina if that would be good, one. like a protein shake popsicle. Katrina makes these. Uh, what's the what's the 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 electrolyte thing that you when your kids are like dehydrated from Pedialyte. Pedialyte. She does. She mixes like a three to one ratio water to Pedialyte to for popsicles for Max. Oh, interesting. That's <laughs> what he's been having forever. Really? I yeah. I don't know. Man, what, when he has a real popsicle one day, he's gonna be like, "What the fuck, Dad?" Yeah, yeah. we yeah, gave him a real. Yeah, we gave him a real lollipop the other day because we're trying to train him to uh use the toilet so cute i forgot to tell you guys this story was so funny so like this is what's kind of cool and I'm, I'm like katrina and i were like high-fiving each other like yeah i'm so proud of us we waited almost three years to like introduce sugar to this kid so it's got so much power now you know <laughs> so it's like oh, yeah. yeah so it's like this little lollipop he gets he gets treat a, goes a long he, way and we by the way we still didn't even get like a traditional super sweet lollipop i found this brand that's like super low yeah. like sugar everything right but it's more than he's ever had so we introduced it to him to go in the, the toilet and he, you know, we got him to pee in the toilet the other day for the first time and, you know, gave him his lollipop and he was so pumped about it. So yesterday on the way home, Katrina calls me and she goes, your son's been sitting on the toilet for 30 minutes trying to pee because he wants a lollipop. So <laughs> just, she goes, she says like, he's sitting there, he's farting and everything. Like he's just trying to squeeze anything out. He wants that lollipop so damn bad. It's Give like, him a lollipop for a fart. Yeah, yeah, Poor kid. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah I do that for You won't even reasons. leave the toilet. He's just like, I'm going to sit here until I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a dad's best friend is just sitting the, on the toilet for an hour. Uh, the, uh, and, oh, he's learning, bro. The yeah, exactly. He's uh, doing the dad hack. I'll yeah. see you guys later. So yep. funny. This is what dad does. No, don't say that. My wife thinks I actually do that. Do and that. so does Katrina. Katrina will follow me up there and be like, are you in the bathroom again? Yeah. I'm yeah. not escaping, okay, yeah. honey? I actually <laughs> take that long. This is my private yeah. time. Leave me yeah. alone. Yeah, things are moving. Hey, real quick. You got to go check out one of our uh, partners, Olipop. They make sodas that are good for your gut health and low in calories. Check out these flavors. They have flavors like strawberry vanilla, orange squeeze cherry vanilla. Um, I like their, I think it's fruit punch. It's one of my favorites. Anyway, they taste amazing. Each can is like 35 calories and they have compounds in there that are good for gut health. That's what's amazing about their sodas. They're really good for you. So we drink them all the time. Go check them out. Head over to mindpumppartners.com. Click on Olipop. Use the code mindpump for a discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Nick from Colorado. Nick, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, how's it going, guys? Um, yeah, so um, the question I have is uh, in reference to anaerobic. Uh, I guess I guess you can call it cardio, um, but it basically revolving around uh, 
the muscle stimulus that could come from it. So the overall question is, uh, do you feel anaerobic cardio or like explosive bodyweight exercises such as like sprints, squat jumps, um, or even like he- uh, hitting the heavy bag with like punches or kicks, et cetera, produces a uh, muscle building signal similar to or less than weight training? Um, I bring this up because from personal experience and, uh, you know, when looking at athletes that emphasize much of this in their training, um, they almost always are like lean and muscular, um, even when weightlifting might not be as much of a focus. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously I know they burn more calories than average people, but I was wondering let's if, fir- uh, let's first, oh, sorry, go ahead. Let's first address the athlete thing. In fact, I think, uh, Sal brought this off, uh, brought this up off air yesterday. Yeah. We were actually- just talking about, we we're just talking about how people, look at athletes and then, you know, we try and attach the sport or what they're doing to, Oh, look at how their bodies look when the truth, the reverse is what's happening is they already are these, you know, the superior, they have superior genes athletically and therefore they gravitate towards these sports. It's not the way they train that makes, I mean, I've met plenty of football players that eat Taco Bell twice a day and touch weights, you know, hardly ever. And they look, better than I looked on stage. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's, a, it's a good point because yeah. uh, although the, the, the sports themselves does contribute obviously to fitness and changes yeah, sure, in the body, sure. but when we look at the top level of athletes, what you're looking at are hardworking, genetically gifted, specific to the sport that they compete in types of people. So in other words, if I looked at the top level swimmers in the world, you know, maybe I would assume that swimming a lot would give me a, 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 sh- a long torso, short legs and long arms, right? So we don't necessarily want to look at top athletes and do that. Although, although we can get some clues. Now, what you did, what you're saying about sprints and explosive movements, jumping, that kind of stuff. There's definitely truth to that. The That type of cardio is the resistance training or strength training of cardio. Okay. It does build muscle. So a sprint will build leg muscles. Um, similar, but not the same as strength training. Strength training incorporates the eccentric portion of a repetition, which has a lot of muscle building potential. And so that would be the missing thing. However, explosive movements do build bigger muscle fibers because bigger muscle fibers contract harder and produce more power. Well, here's the thing is uh, when you're talking about speed, which is really what you're talking about when you're talking about being explosive and having this type of movement activity, you're generating a lot of force. And so that force itself is a signal uh, that you need, you know, more fast twitch activity. Uh, You know, your muscles need to respond accordingly. Um, And the way you structure it in terms of it being more anaerobic is going to play a factor in terms of how your body responds. But um, in in terms of building muscle, it's not, you know, that's not the ideal pathway to go. It's just, you know, it, it, it does stimulate it. It does have a factor in there, but it's definitely not uh, anywhere close to, to resistance training. I'm so glad you said that, Justin, because that's the thing that needs to be addressed here is that it's it really w- what the question we need to know is like, what's your desired outcome, first of all? Um, or if you're trying to be an athlete, then doing some of these things like the athletic training, that makes total sense to train this way. But if your desired outcome is to look like the athlete, me, uh, i.e., I want to build muscle and be shredded and lean, therefore I want to do these exercises I hear or see them doing, that's that's not the best approach. There is a better approach to building more muscle faster and getting leaner faster. There, there are two different goals and two different th- ways that I would train the body to, to get that. And the idea of, oh, let's combine it all together because this is what we see athletes, they look this way and therefore I'm going to train this way. It, depending on the client's goal, uh, I'm most likely not going to use that method of training to get their desired outcome. Because what most clients say to me is they, they use an athlete and they go, check it. I love the way this guy looks. And he's yeah, also- make me look like them. Yeah, make me look like them. And I see he's doing oh, these- like Jackson. I see him doing these jump boxes and these ice skaters and he's doing these like cool moves. Like, so let's follow his training, right? It's like, no, what he's doing is specific to his sport. And whoever's training him has got him doing that because it benefits him on the field or whatever sport we're talking about. He didn't go to his coach and go like, hey, I want to be the best looking basketball player on the on the court. He's like, I want to be the best basketball player. I just happen to have great genetics. And so I look yeah. awesome while I do it. So if you're the average person who is who's asking this question, I would 
I would propose a question back saying, okay, well, what is your goal? What is your desired outcome? Are you trying to be athletic and therefore you want to follow these types of programs? Or do you have a look you're trying to obtain? And if that's the case, then I would tell you that this is not the, the best strategy for us to get there. I think there's a lot of value in this style of training too, even for your average person. We've talked about this too, about how we, you know, we lose this ability over time as we, as we yep. age, especially. Yep. And so um, doing a sort of a lower risk version of this is, is very advantageous, uh, especially when you're in situations, just life situations where you have to move really quickly and your body has to respond. A lot of times this is where people get injuries and uh, it's, it's over like the most ridiculous thing. Like, you know, you slip or uh, you miss a step or, mm -hmm. you know, you're reaching back really fast. So, um, you know, this will help train your body. And so I would just say, like, look at it in terms of a phase, like you're going to like weave this into your programming. Um, because it does have a lot of value. Yeah. Now that being said, this isn't going to make you lose muscle. Um, right. it's, 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 it is a muscle building contributor. Is it going to build more muscle Hell no. than just strength training? I mean, if it improves your ability to, to lift, then it might, right. If it, if it gives you more stability to help you work out, it could. Uh, but I don't think it's like Adam said, it's not like a strategy to do that, but if you're doing cardio and you're like, I want to do a form of cardio, that's not going to make me you know, potentially send a, a conflicting signal and lose some muscle. This is the way to do it. Now, there is a right way to do it though, Nick, okay? It's number one, you better have the prerequisite stability yeah. um, and control to do it because it's far more risky doing explosive movements than it is to do controlled movements. So that's yeah. number one. Number two, you have to treat it like strength training. In other words, don't do it to fatigue or otherwise you're just doing cardio. It, it stops being anaerobic. It's now aerobic. So in other words, don't, you see people do this all the time. They'll do jump boxes as part of a big circuit and they're so exhausted and it's all about getting tired, in which case it really doesn't matter what you do. You can jump in place. You're going to get the same result. You want to be explosive with it and treat it like a set. So like five explosive jumps and then rest for a minute or two and then try again. The goal being to jump as high as you can, not jump as much as you can or build stamina doing that. So you got to definitely do it uh, the right way. Now, Nick, now that we're done lecturing you, uh, why don't you tell us what exactly what your goal is? <laughs> yeah, we got to jump in there yeah, real quick. Yeah, yeah, let's just assume this guy wants to do all this shit. <laughs> so tell us, tell us exactly um, your goal. I want to hear what, like what, what, you, what, you're, what you're going for. Um, I definitely, you know, kind of, kind of two full goal. I mean, I like, uh, I definitely want to be like, you know, going, as I'm going into like my forties, as, as lean as I can. Um, I'm very avid weightlifter. Um, I used to be an athlete. One of the reasons I brought up like the, the, the kitchen, the kicking and the punching was I used to do boxing and MMA in college. Um, and I really, I missed that activity. Mm -hmm. Um, but overall, yeah, I'd say just, you know, staying lean, not falling into the metabolic effect that y'all talk about a lot of, you know, going to slow cardio and that slowing my metabolism down. Um, but also, maintaining some level of athleticism. I don't have the same knees anymore. I was in the Marine Corps for 10 years and my knees are definitely beat down. So I can't like really run anymore. So it's like, what sort of athletic activities can I do combined with the weight training that I do um, to remain athletic, still remain lean, but not mess up my metabolism, oh, I guess. I, so it's like kind of a twofold question. I, I, or I, issue. I, okay. I love, I love something. Okay. You said something that uh, we didn't address that I think is also important. Another thing that would be important to finding out about my client before I would give them advice is that you enjoy doing this, right? So sometimes uh, I'm going to advise my client to go in a path that I know that there's a faster path to get them to their goal or a, even a better path to get to their goal. But part of their goal is, man, I really, Adam, I, I love doing this athletic stuff. Yeah. If you plan you know? on doing it forever, yeah, you better it, like it. Yeah. I enjoy it. It makes me, it makes me feel good when I do it. It's fun. I have that kind of, and so that's where the, as a coach, I'm, I'm going to take, okay, my, my knowledge around, you know, building bodies and go, okay, yeah, I know there's a better way or a faster way potentially to get this guy to where he wants to potentially look, but he's also saying things like, Hey, I, I really enjoy doing this. And so to me, I, th I think you're like a maps performance is a perfect program for you. Like maps performance is going to give you that the, the athleticism that you're appealing that, you, that appeals to you while also still strength training you and phasing you in and out. Kind of like what Justin said. So 
Um, I absolutely, if you don't have that program, we'll send that to you because to me, that's based off of your goals. That is like the perfect program and you're going to get yep. a lot of the things that you're looking for, uh, you know, in that program. Yeah. We'll send that to you, Nick. I think that'll be perfect for you. And then when it comes to being lean, that's largely, largely a product of diet. Yep. I mean, the, the, the muscle aspect of course makes a big, uh, big impact, but you're already kind of doing the strength training. That's going to be diet. So I, I really, when it comes to exercising, in a way to get lean, really what you want to do is exercise in a way to maintain a faster metabolism. And then the other half of that is just, it's always going to be diet. So no matter what, so that's going to be the big, the big factor here. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate the time. Huge fan. Um, I, I, you guys talk more about the metabolism than probably anyone else on, on, uh, these podcasts. So I really appreciate, uh, the insight there. You got it, man. Appreciate you calling in. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks guys. Take it easy. Take it easy. Yeah. You, Justin, you said something about losing the ability and you know, you can hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, that's happened to me a couple times. I was me too. Uh, I, I, that I was, was a great point. Oh yeah, dude. I was, uh, I told this story before, but my, when my oldest was little, he was at the top of the stairs and I mean, I've been working out forever with weights and I was younger than I am now. So I can't even imagine if I did this now, but he goes to, to, jump off the top steps. Cause I used to have him jump off one of the steps and I'd catch him. Mm -hmm. Well, he saw me at the bottom, goes to jump off the top. I grabbed the railing and launched myself up the stairs and I ripped the railing off the wall, caught him, literally pulled every muscle on the left side of my body <laughs> because of the superhero dad moves. But yeah. But it was the explosiveness, yeah, right? Because totally. I have the strength, but I didn't ever train. I didn't train lots of explosive power. So my body didn't have the ability to really control or stabilize. So I ended up hurting you know, half my body was as a result. And it's true. Like you'll, you'll yeah. get fit and strong in the gym. You'll miss a step, go to step real fast. Oh, how did I hurt myself? I always work out. Well, yeah. you, it's an ability. It's a skill. You got to train it. Yeah. I mean, you overcorrect at yeah. that point if you're not familiar with those movements anymore. And it's just one of those things that like really quickly, like you don't have that ability anymore. So to, to train it is definitely something that now, and I didn't really consider that until we had Joe DeFranco on. Yeah. Too. I'm like, oh my God, what a great point. So, you know, that's definitely something that I've been, I've been noticing a lot too, you know, even with my parents and with everybody else, I'm like trying to get them to move fast every now and then just to maintain the ability. No, I mean, I, I shared on the podcast a while back, it was almost a year ago, I think when I jumped out of the back of my truck, you know, I have a lifted Chevy and when I jump out, like it's something I've done probably a hundred times plus and mm -hmm. never thought twice about it. And I thought my knees were going to explode, <laughs> yeah. you know, and you know, when you hit the ground hard. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. And, and, and really what the awakening for me was, um, I had, I never stopped consistently lifting weights and training, but what I had stopped is a lot of athletic training, a lot yeah. of explosive type of movements. Um, and th that naturally just kind of wove its way into my my routine because I've always played sports. And this mm -hmm. is the longest period of time in my life right. that I've gone without playing any sort of sports. Well, if I don't play any sports, I'm also not training to kind of prepare myself for that. So I've lost an ability that I just thought I would have, for, you know, I, you know, thought I would have ever. I know better. I should know better. I wouldn't have it forever. But like when I jumped out of that truck, I didn't think that I would feel that way. It's something I've done so many times, but it, it's, you know, if you don't, if you don't train it, you'll lose it. The body will prune off that ability, even if you're a strong person in the gym and fit. I mean, body fat percentage is good. I'm strong in the gym, but I don't train that way of movement. Hey, this is why we, yeah. we you know, are such big advocates of certain barbell movements. Like, yeah, you can work out your legs with leg presses and leg extensions and, you know, hack squats and stuff like that. But you stop squatting and you'll have strong legs from the other exercises, but that skill of squatting, which is fundamental, it'll start to slip away from you. You'll get under a bar or try to squat and you just don't have the same. So, you know, strength and, and it's all, so much of it is a skill that you have to practice all these movements, not just have the muscles that contribute to the movements. That's the important thing to understand. Our next caller is Michelle from California. Hi, Michelle. How can we help you? Hey guys, thank you so much for taking my question and just for all the content you put out there. Um, I was super lucky. I was recommended your podcast back when I first became a trainer at Gold's Gym and skipped past all the mistakes. I hear you guys say a lot of trainers make. Um, and now four years later, I'm a full-time mental health therapist as well as a personal trainer in a private setting and a bikini competitor. So I use all the tools you guys put out awesome. to help my clients and myself. So thank awesome. you. That's awesome. Excellent. Yeah. So I'll jump right into my question and then maybe give a little background information. Um, my question is, is it detrimental to make a drastic drop in calories below maintenance 
in order to obtain long-term weight loss. And part of the reason I asked this question, as I said, I'm a bikini competitor and I'm currently in my off season from competing. And the main goal during my off season is to rebalance my hormones because those were super off, uh, make sure all my like biomarkers are good, my sleep, my stress, my mental health, trying to get all that balanced, um, as well as like find out what diet works best for me. And the thing is, I was at maybe 1100 calories, 90 minutes of cardio when I last stepped on stage and I worked in a reverse all the way up to about 2700 calories with barely any cardio. Um, That's phenomenal. So, yeah, gained a lot of muscle, did, you know, ate a lot of food, gained a lot of muscle and made some great progress. But as you guys know, summer's coming up. So I did still, even though I'm not competing, I still wanted to jump into a cut. And immediately my coach put me in like a big deficit, 700 calories to like 1400 calories. Some days were no carbs, which I've literally never done in my life. Uh, so I'm just, I lost a lot of weight, obviously, but I'm just really terrified of the idea of like, okay, once I get, once I stop losing weight, like, what can we do? Like how much lower am I going to have to go? How much like cardio will I have to do? Cause I really don't want to stress if I'm not doing a show this year. Is he cycling you out of that cut? Like, are do you, are you, is that just a temporary thing or is that like a permanent, Hey, for the next few weeks or months, we're going to do this. What's it look like? So at first I thought it was like a one week, see where you're at, see how much weight you lose. And then we'll adjust from there. And then one week turned to two weeks and then two weeks turns to three weeks. And then I, I went rogue ultimately. Yeah. And now I'm kind of trying to build my own program, but I'm scared if I, if I increase the calories too much, now I'm going to gain the 10 pounds that I lost. And I don't want that to happen, but I, I do, I not having carbs made me like crazy. It made me have a headache and all that. I, I really struggled. So well, it's, well, Michelle, it's like it Michelle, let me ask you a quick, cause your original question was, <laughs> is, is it detrimental to make those drastic drops? For mm -hmm. long-term weight not loss. And you went from 2,700 calories to, you said, 700 to 1,400 calories. Yeah, I, what, cycle. What do you think? Like, what do you think that this is well, let me, unhealthy? Because I, I want to know what your opinion is before I answer. Because I have a feeling that you might know the answer already and you might just want confirmation. Well, so originally I, I gave a little pushback to my coach um, and then tried to see it from that perspective. I mean... I just don't know. So I feel like it is. I feel like I've been taught to slowly decrease, decrease, decrease. But I wasn't sure if his goal was to make me lose a lot of fat, a lot of weight, and then kind of build up into it. Because, um, you know, like, ideally, I'd love to go into a show eating more than being at my lowest, which is what I've done in the yeah. past. So I don't know if that was the game plan or if he thought maybe I won't lose as much muscle if I do it quickly. Two big red flags here. One you didn't know what the plan was. That's a, that's a, that's a crappy coach. You should know what you're going to be doing, not just here's this and then we'll figure it out. So you should already know. He should explain that to you. Yeah. It sounds like he just did a massive calorie cut, sees that you're leaning out and says, Oh, we'll just stay the course until we, until it's not working. Yeah. Number two, here's another red flag. And this one really pertains to you, Michelle. Why are you, why are you hiring a coach that's saying this to you when the, you're a trainer, you've been a trainer for four years. What would you tell your client? Like, why are you allowing this person to kind of ruin your body, ruin your health through an approach like this? I think you know the answer. That's something you need to answer for yourself. Like, why are you seeking this out with somebody? Do you think he's going to have the magic answer that's going to give you something that has worked for nobody? Well, I'm sure he's. I'm, I'm sure he 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 touts himself as a, a professional in the bodybuilding space. Sure, but that's not the point, right? Yeah. Like, 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 what is it, Michelle, that makes you that made you want to do this and stick to it for a few weeks? Like, that's an important question to answer. I think curiosity as a coach and as someone, I mean, you guys have talked a lot about trying different diets, things like that. I'd never tried no carbs. So I was curious, right. To see, okay, how is my body going to respond? I realized it didn't work. And I did communicate with my coach like, Hey, this isn't working. I'm going to try to add carbs. I'm going to do something different. Um, but I'm, I'm curious if it, it, cause he, there are some people that are still doing this diet. So I'm curious as yeah. to what, uh I, well, that's oh, fair. I, I mean, that's fair. You want to try something out. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. Three weeks isn't going to ruin your metabolism, so you're okay. Yeah, so I'm glad you said that because that's what I've been wanting to jump in and say yeah. right now. So our, our we have a uh, good friend, Jordan Syatt, and also Eugene Tao. I think I saw it. Did, they did this a while back. I've seen them both do it on their social media where 
uh, they tried to adjust, uh, address coaches that, you know, are alarmist about, you know, calorie restriction and saying that you're not going to destroy your metabolism over, you know, a week or two of super low calorie. In fact, and they were making the case for how it could be healthy for you and it's not. And they're right. Like in a, in a short period of time, a really, really low calorie diet is not, it's when it gets becomes chronic yep. when we get into trouble. And now what I would be concerned as a coach is if you've you've already been there before where you were chronically under eating and I'm now putting you in that position again, I'm flirting with potentially bad behaviors. So and this is and that's when you have another level of coaching when they're like not only are they looking at the X's and O's, but they're also taking into account what I don't want to do to this girl is I don't want to restrict her so hard that she falls into old patterns again and she just cuts, 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 cuts. The other red flag is that, you know, he didn't build in like a calorie surplus day in that time. Like you could easily see incredible benefits cutting a tremendous amount of calories in a short period of time. And then also just ran like inserting once a week or once every 10 days but or so a, a, a high refeed. I did get a cheat. I get did get a cheat kind of day meal um, every week, which was different than I've ever done. Whenever I compete, I'd never get any cheat meals. So it was different where he would break up that calorie deficit. Well, how did he explain the cheat meal? What What is that? What do you mean by that? As it will often, I mean, again, I'm not competing, so I wasn't as rigid, but it would be like, um, you know, eat 10 ounce steak with eight ounces of potato or something that was a lot higher in fat, carbs, protein, okay. um, to just boost up. And the idea was to kind of, um, re-engage my metabolism or kickstart my metabolism back. So it didn't get too adjusted to the low calories. How high, how high was he going? Cause a, a steak and potato is not like, yeah, that's one meal. So yeah, like, what would that so, take your calories? To? Yeah. What would it take your cal this, this cheat meal or slash day. If you were restricting 1400 calories a day, let's say. Well, seven to four, 700 to 1400. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 700 to 1400 calories a day. What did the day when you decided to get, or when you were allowed to get this cheat meal, what did that push you up to? It, Pushed me up to probably like eighteen hundred or so. Mm. Eight eight to eight eighteen hundred total calories for when day. you were coming. Yeah, that's still a cut. You were coming. You were you were just saying a couple of weeks ago you're twenty seven hundred. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a surplus. I would take you back to maintenance surplus, which would be twenty seven to twenty nine hundred calories for that one day. You're not. Yeah. You're going from an extreme cut to a kind of cut is still keeping you chronically cutting. Yeah. So well, 1800 calories is a 900 calorie cut from what she was at. That's before. what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's what I'm saying. You, you didn't go to a surplus. A surplus mm -hmm. would be, or at least maintenance at 2,700. Yeah. So going from 1100 or being super low and then bumping you up four or 500 calories is not doing it. The, the body is still starving for nutrients. It's, it's not, you're depriving, you're still depriving it from yeah. where you were just a month ago. So uh, yeah, no, that's not, there's a lot of red flags here on, as far as the, the, the coaching strategy here, the Sal pointed out, not, not even knowing what you're doing. Uh, I don't think it's necessary for you to have to cut that much. Not doing like a proper refeed, in my opinion. Like, so there's a lot of those things that I, I'm I'm not a fan of. But I do want to mm -hmm. make clear that I don't want to I don't want to be alarmist uh, with this because I think what both Jordan Syatt and our friend Eugene Tao, the post that they did, I think it was a a good post when they shared this that. You know, it is okay. I do this all the time where, you know, I've been eating in a surplus for a while. I'm like, you know what? This week I'm just gonna I'm gonna eat real low calorie. Yeah, I mean, you oh. can literally fast for seven days. Yeah. And eat nothing. Yeah, and it's, it's not gonna and it's not gonna fuck your metabolism. No, up. I mean it, it, it depends on the person, of course, if you're in yeah. like extreme, context right? But matters. average yeah, context matters. But for the average person, short period isn't isn't gonna isn't gonna cause that. Long term, it can definitely cause some issues. Now you're not competing anymore. What is your goal exactly? You have a specific goal? Like are you trying to drop a, per, a certain percent body fat? Well, the idea, I mean, I, I plan on competing. I want to go on the national stage to try to get my pro card. Um, oh, okay. but I also, the feedback is always grow, grow, grow. So I want, I, so I built a lot of muscle and I, I want to know, I want to get lean enough to see where I'm at and see if I can go into a show or if I should get back into a bulk and build more muscle so that when I get on the pro, sure. on well, the stage. Sure. Well, hey, yeah. Michelle, a three week aggressive cut like you did and then going back to to kind of a small a short bulk that's a great strategy actually that's yeah. a, that's a that's not a bad strategy if it's only two or three weeks and then you go back to you know to to a, a small bulk that's not a bad strategy at minimizing fat gain or even losing some body fat and and, and then trying to build in that short bulk uh, period 
So I, I, I like that strategy. I yeah. don't like the long term cut. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I get it before a show. I mean, when you're trying to get on stage, nothing that you do, especially the, the, the few weeks leading to a show is going to be healthy. So I get that. But right now you're just kind of trying to see for yourself. There's nothing wrong with the alternating approach where you kind of trend towards getting leaner, but you're giving your body, definitely giving your body time to have more calories and more nutrients and, you know, kind of preserving some of the muscle that you've built. Yeah, I think there was an episode that I listened to that Adam had actually kind of suggested something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was when I was just starting this and it was like three, I think it was like, yeah, three days of super of deficit and then three days of, um, a more maintenance or above maintenance calorie range. And the thing is I've, I've been in this kind of deficit and then going up and kind of going back and forth and I've maintained a lot of muscle. I mean, I think I wrote down that I, I just hit a PR for four or five for my glute bridges. Like I'm surprised that my strength is not going down. My strength is going up. Awesome. While still in this deficit. Awesome. Yeah, yeah no, that, I mean, that's a good sign. Yeah. That, that That's definitely a good sign. So, but I would keep those short. I would, especially now. Now, when you get into show prep, that's a little different. Uh, but for something like this, you've already done three weeks. I would go back to maintenance for a couple. If your old goal is ultimately to get leaner, then you want the cuts to be a little longer than the bulks, right? Um, so I would go like three week cut, maybe a two week, one and a half to two week, you know, maintenance or slight bulk, and then go back to a three week type cut until you, and it'll, it'll take you longer to get there, but it's not going to cause uh, problems. But also, you know, pay attention. You sound like you're pretty put together. Just pay attention to the behaviors that that might encourage. It's it's not, you know, that up and down with the food. If you find yourself feeling restrictive and then bingy, um, then go back to something more consistent because that's going to be most important. That's what's going to stick to you past these competitions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a mental health therapist. Uh, that's first right. and foremost, mental right. health is always number one, um, especially when it comes to food habits and living. Excellent. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, you yeah. get it. You get it. No, perfect. Michelle, is there any yeah. program we can give you? Can we give you something to follow? Um, I mean, I have almost all of them. The only one I don't have is PED, but I don't know if that's <laughs> <laughs> probably not what you need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you get the new one already? Did you get symmetry? Yeah, we yeah, we got it. Awesome. Uh, oh, okay, good deal. Got the symmetry and, and the two ebooks it came with. So well, oh, if you stop deal. by, we'll give you a hug. Well, I was going to say about the forum. Would I be able to join that? Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll let you in for sure. Yeah. And yeah, in fact, have, by the way, we have we have quite a few uh, competitors in there and a lot of people that have coached themselves, some people that are not, some people I've actually coached are in there. So yeah, there's a great com com community in there around the com it's a competition. So make sure you get in there and introduce yourself. Yeah, that would be so helpful. Awesome. We'll yeah. see you in there then. Thanks for calling in, Michelle. Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you said that, Adam. I mean, three weeks, right? It's not going to do. I mean, you could literally, you could literally fast for a week, like yeah. eat nothing, mm -hmm. and of course, you got to be healthy and all that stuff, and it's not going to have this, this crazy, you know, detrimental effect on your metabolism. But you follow a super low calorie calorie diet plus lots of exercise yeah. for two months, three months, four months. Yeah. Well, now that adaptation starts to happen. It's really, the behaviors and the trends. You yeah. Watch with that. Yeah. The temporary approach. You, you know, you can rebound from that pretty good. It actually benefits you. Well, in some sense. cases, especially yeah. when it, it, it's consistently for months, and the direction you're always going is yes, less yes. and less and less and less. Like without yeah. any sort of interruption of hey, how about for a week we run to a maintenance mm -hmm. surplus? And I think it's as simple as that. But I think you hit it on the head. Like there's several red flags here with just his approach. The fact that he's not sharing what the plan is already. Is right. well, I mean, a lot of these coaches is just, you need clarity. You need that up front. Well, as they hit the same button every time. They do. Oh, you want to hire me? Here we go. Boom. Low calorie. Boom. Extra workouts. Yeah. And then they, and they, Oh, they, stop working. Lower calorie. Extra they, workouts. And they ride that train totally. as long as they can. Yeah. It sounds exactly what he's doing is just like, I'm just going to cut calories. Oh, she's still seeing results. She's still strong. Keep yeah. pushing it. Yeah. yeah. Just keep pushing More it. More cardio. Yeah. It's just lower eating. It's terrible. Our next caller is Zach from Maryland. Zach, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Really appreciate you having me on and just want to start by thanking you for all of the great information that you're putting out there. Um, yeah, when I was first trying to lose a bunch of weight, I, I got all caught up in the, the trendy fads. So you guys got me right on, on the right track with fitness. So cool. uh, just awesome. really can't thank you enough. Awesome. Um, yeah. So yeah, for context, I'm a former college football player. Um, I played O-line and I've lost a bunch of weight since, since I finished playing. And 
uh, you know, undergone significant body recomposition by following the MAPS programs. Uh, so I followed the RGB bundle and I'm currently in phase three of aesthetic. Um, and so this is my first time in, you know, really 10 plus years of lifting that I'm focusing primarily on, on getting a pump is sort of the, the main adaptation. Um, yeah, I've sort of gotten it before. I'm familiar with it, but this has never been the, the main focus. So um, my question is that I'm finding that I can find or I can lift greater weights um, with the higher reps prescribed in the, the supersets in phase three with good form. Uh, but it kind of takes away from the feel of the muscles. And if I lift lighter weights, um, you know, I can really you know, focus on that mind muscle connection and, and squeeze the muscles more uh, over the same number of reps and, and kind of increase the, the feel of the pump that I'm getting. Um, so, you know, my thought is that I probably should do the, the latter and focus on the feel of the muscles, but just want to, you know, make, making that lightweight feel as heavy as possible and, and do more with it. Uh, but want to confirm that that's the right approach and, you know, whether you have any tips on, you know, how to know that you're at the correct weight for, you know, not going too light, but not going too heavy that you can't focus on. I like on this. Yeah, no, you're I, on, like, I like how you're presenting that. You're on point. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what you want to do, especially with the phase like that. Yeah. When you're doing low rep program, training, focus for yeah, sure. yes. I mean, when you're doing low rep training, you know, you're doing like five reps, uh, and you're doing compound lifts. It's about the movement. It's about movement efficiency, maximizing leverage. Right. When you're doing the higher reps, bodybuilder style training, it's all about the feel, and you're better off for the most part. Now, I, I know I'm talking to somebody who used to play college football. Right. You, you in, in your question, you, you wrote down that you played college football before yeah. you. So you were a high level athlete, you're probably pretty strong, or you have at least the propensity for tremendous strength. There's a risk versus reward here when we go with heavy weight. The reward with going heavier can be more muscle growth, but it depends on who I'm talking to. Someone like you, you're better off making the weight feel heavier than adding weight to the bar. You're gonna get, you're still gonna build muscle, but you're gonna reduce the risk of injury with the higher, uh, with the heavier weight. So you're better off with the feel, especially with the phase three okay. of MAPS aesthetic. So you're, you're on point. When I train this way, if I feel like I can add five pounds or 10 pounds to the bar, all I do is I try to make the, the set harder myself so I don't have to add weight. I get way better results that way. I guarantee this is a novel stimulus for you. Uh, knowing, yeah, knowing like what the training used to look like for football, um, this is, this is the perfect, uh, opportunity for you to really focus in on a completely different approach to weight training. And so you're, you're right on point in terms of like really trying to mind muscle connection is, is where you want to live. And, and really, I, I think one of the things that I found myself as, as far as like always trying to intensify everything, um, because of the type of workouts I used to do forever, um, you know, this is, this is one of those things like, don't go super fast, like really feel it. Like, yeah. you know, you know, uh, slow yourself down because like, because it's high reps and because it's lighter weight, a lot of times people tend to like rush their way through it, uh, in terms of like the way that I used to approach it. So I, I think that that's one thing like you're already on point in terms of, of how you're looking at it. So I just want to reiterate that. Yeah, I don't have much to contribute to that. I think that uh, other than I think great self-awareness, I think that um, men tend to have a tendency to uh, put more weight on the bar than they should. Especially if you play college football. Yeah, especially I mean, if you yeah. have an athletic background. So the fact that you've got the awareness that you probably have that tendency and you probably should lighten the load and focus on squeeze, I think is great, man. I think, I think more people, uh, especially men, uh, need to do that. I think it's really, and I'm, I'm as guilty of, of the same thing. You get in the gym, you start feeling good, you know, grabbing, you know, 10 or 15 more pounds to add to it because I can, you know, I, I get, let that get in the way sometimes. And I know that I should focus on the squeeze and the form and the technique. You're going to get just as much, if not more out of it, plus, uh, without the, as much risk. So, yeah, no, I think uh, I think you got the the right the right attitude, and I think you're going to continue to yeah. see great results. Zach, you did maps anabolic, maps performance, and now you're finishing maps aesthetic, right? Yep, yep. I'm planning to go to symmetry next. This uh, the uh, slowing these reps down has made me notice some uh, imbalances. So. Do you Excited have do you have symmetry, that. or can I send that to you? I, I do have symmetry. Okay, uh, all, right. Awesome, all right. Well, you you almost got it for free. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I should have waited. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, what about? Do you have anything for correctional stuff like Maps Prime, like a, a Prime Pro? Do you have that? Not yet. Prime okay. Pro, I, I definitely am interested in. Let me send that to you because I think that'll. That no matter what program you do, what you'll find in Maps Prime Pro is going to help you out, especially in X 
athlete like yourself, there's going to be certain muscle imbalances or movement issues that you're going to start to identify, especially when you go through map symmetry and prime mm-hmm. pro is a, is a beautiful addition. That's awesome. Really, really appreciate that. No problem, man. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Keep it Thanks. up, man. You know, I'm going to say this, this is, and this is, uh, I think generally true, obviously it depends on who I'm talking to, but you know, adding weight to the bar is really important when you first start working out later on making the weight feel heavier, heavier rather than adding weight to the bar becomes more important. Like the mind to muscle connection, bodybuilding style type training. I say style in quotations. because I think correctional work and in multiplanar, you know, movements are crucial that bodybuilders tip, tip, typically don't do, but that style of training where you're feeling the muscle connecting, making the weight feel heavier and not adding weight to the bar. That's a better longevity approach to strength training. It really is. Once you reach a certain point of strength, the risk versus reward just doesn't make sense to keep trying to add weight to the bar unless you're a competitive power lifter. You know? I'm just stoked that somebody like this found their way to our programs and found their way to this because it, this is such a high risk um, you know, individual in terms of coming from a sport like that and eating the amount of calories they're eating yeah. and the explosive, like damaging type of, uh, you know, activity they're, they're a part of like, and then go shift completely to, to regular life that's sedentary and all this. Like I've just seen so many examples of, especially like O lineman, D lineman, where, you know, the health problems just snowball. It just accelerates. So, uh, you know, kudos to him for for really going through this and and getting back on on a, on a good path. Oh, totally. I, I've have you trained? You ever trained ex athletes in this situation? It's so hard to get them to switch mentalities totally. because Impossible it's almost. like yeah. I mean, because for so long, that's how you lifted. That's how you trained. That's how you ate. And now you're like, no, no, no. Slow down. Feel the muscle. I'm like what? Like I, I can I lift more. Let me go faster. Let me go harder. You know. That's yeah. why my own my only contribution to the conversation was great self awareness because yeah. I think yeah. uh, I think most people already struggle. Most men struggle with this as it is, and then if you're also coming from that background, really hard to make that that mental shift. Our next caller is Ashley from Ohio. What's up, Ashley? How can we help you? Hi guys, I did just want to say thank you for thank you to all of you for taking the time out of your day to do things like this. It's extremely valuable um, to people like myself. So I do have two questions unrelated. One is about fitness and one about nutrition. So hoping we can get to both. The first one though is about nutrition. So I've read quite a few books regarding carbohydrates and sugars and long-term how they affect us with chronic diseases and even in the short-term how they affect our bodies, uh, processing of fats and the protein that we eat. So just per my understanding, when we eat carbs or sugars, of course, our, our body releases insulin to regulate the glucose in our blood. But that also that insulin also stops the fat from being able to freely move in and out of our fat cells. Basically, it locks up our fat, and that's what eventually causes weight gain. So I do track my macros. My priority is always protein. Um, I'm always at 125 grams a day or more. And I do stick to a very low carbohydrate diet, not quite keto, but I try to stay under a hundred grams a day. Um, sometimes it's more like 50 or 60 grams a day. And I feel fine with that, but I, I just, I don't understand, I guess, based on all the information that I've read, the things that I've learned, I, I don't understand where carbohydrates should really fit into a healthy diet. And then that kind of leads me to, obviously it's hard to cut out all carbs, but fruit I know is good. So just trying to get your guys' opinion on carbohydrates and where they do fit in a healthy my, diet. My opinion is this is why the fitness industry sucks yeah. because we do this. We, we overcomplicate something that is much simpler uh, than what we're making it and we try and scare people into a, a way of thinking or eating to sell my books or to sell my program or to sell my diet. And it's unfortunate because you can tell you're you're very smart. I can tell that you understand that, but yet you're asking a very good question based off of probably conflicting stuff that you hear around carbohydrates yeah. and insulin. It's like- They're not, car- carbs are not, are not bad. No. Um, if you look at the issues with carbohydrate intake, what you're seeing is the result of excess calories. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm oversimplifying. Of course, there's healthier versus less healthy foods. This is true for fats and proteins as well as, as carbohydrates. 
But generally speaking, if you look at like the obesity epidemic, and they've done this, right? They'll be like, oh, it's because we're consuming more fat. That's what happened in the 80s and 90s. They're like, oh, no, no, it's actually carbs. No, what it is is we're eating more of everything. <laughs> Our calories have gone up significantly. Really what, what correlates strongest to the obesity epidemic and inflammation and disease is heavily processed foods and heavily processed foods are just engineered to make us eat, eat yeah. more. So the more of our diets that are made up of heavily processed foods, the more calories we eat. And then that becomes the issue. Sugar, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats don't have lots of negative effects when the calories are appropriate. When the calories are high, sugars become a problem. Certain fats become a problem. Even too many proteins can become a problem when the calories are, are too high. So that's generally what's happening. Okay. Now to take it a step further, if you look at the studies on longevity, you'll find societies where their diets are predominantly or, or a majority of their calories come from carbohydrates and they live a very long time. So this is just, it's just not true. Now are carbs essential? No, they're not essential, but that doesn't mean that they, that eating them is, isn't better or going to make you feel better. Some people feel better on lower carbs or the people feel better on higher carbohydrates. This is where individualism or individual, you know, uh, you know, body physiology kind of plays a role or even psychology. Some people enjoy them more than others, but no, that's not the issue. Now, a lot of times people cut carbs and they feel a lot better and they're like, wow, this is great. What's going on? Heavily processed foods tend to be carb heavy. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen when people cut carbohydrates is they tend to eliminate a lot of the heavily processed foods. Like try to think of heavily processed foods in boxes and wrappers that are fat or protein dominant, right? For protein dominant, what are you going to get jerky? Like that's 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 a it's a processed food, but it's hot it's dog. the least yeah, it's not or hot dogs, I guess, probably not great either, yeah. but most heavily processed foods are kind of carb heavy, so it's a result of of that. So I wouldn't worry about carbohydrates. Gary Tobbs is he 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 definitely can be an alarmist with yeah. certain things. Yes, insulin does what you said, but that's not the full story. Yeah, it's not that simple. No, if you're if your calories are lower than what you're burning and you're eating, you know, 65% of your calories from carbohydrates, you're going to still lose body fat. Like that's I mean, the way you it works. definitely want to pay attention to your behaviors. Like what uh if that promotes if if like sugars or processed foods like you incorporate that into your diet, if it promotes, you know, the next day you you tend to have uh, you know, a higher calorie day again, like a lot of times this kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's a snowball effect. It's something that you can, you know, pay attention to remove and it'll affect your behaviors around eating. But in terms of the overall detrimental effects, it's, it's when you're in a high calorie state. That, that's Justin, that's the most important thing is yeah. you, you knowing yourself and your own behaviors. Now, if you have this tendency to overconsume when you eat carbohydrates, then you might be a client that I'm going to push you more towards a higher fat, yeah. lower carbohydrate diet for the behavioral reasons, not for the insulin purpose. Like that's yeah, not, exactly. I'm not, that's not what I'm thinking about when I tell my client like, Hey, let's cut back on your yeah. car. Unless you're recommended uh, by a, a medical doctor right. because you have you know, right. some kind of blood sugar issues or uh -huh. insulin resistance, in which case, you know, that might be the case. But if you're otherwise healthy, uh, it, no, it doesn't do that. And again, what they're doing is they're looking at what they're doing is they're looking at carbohydrate intake and obesity and inflammation. And yes, when people eat high carbs, you see more inflammation, you see more obesity, but that's because they're also eating a lot more calories, right? It's not the, the carbs, it's the excess calories. Cause you can make the same connection with fat when you do something like that, which is again, what caused all the, you know, the, the false information in the eighties, uh, and the nineties. So it's, it's, it's the complexity of diet is about individual, how the individual responds, how they feel, but the simplicity, generally speaking, really has more to do with calories. Are you getting essential nutrients? Um, and uh, are you overeating or undereating? Really? That's really what it boils down to. Okay. And that was sort of, I guess, you know, his books definitely make me feel like, um, all carbohydrates are just the devil and you should shouldn't eat them, which is why, you know, I've, I've come to you guys asking because I have cut out, you know, the, the very heavily refined carbohydrates, the processed sugars, because they, they aren't satisfying to me. And it does have, for me, it gives me a, a tendency to eat more of them than yeah. that I would eat mm -hmm. of protein or a fat source. Um, and those are easy to cut out and I, it honestly makes me feel better, but good. it was mainly more like when it comes to your vegetables and your fruits, the things that I enjoy that I know are still good for you. 
um, just wanted a little, I guess, reassurance that if those are things that fit into my um, calorie and macro count for the day, that those are, are <laughs> they're not going to throw me way off track. Good, good. And then you had a, did you have a fitness question as well, you said? Yeah. So it actually just any fitness program, but I've been really looking at your guys' programs. Um, I race motocross, ride my dirt bike quite a bit, All right. um, obviously for training. Ooh. So whenever I, and I've been working out consistently for about three years. Um, whenever I have a program, I never know, or I'm looking at a program, I never know how to fit it around my racing and riding schedule. So my goals are obviously strength, um, endurance, and I do have aesthetic goals, goals as well. Um, it feels good to look great. So with, with moto, you don't want to ever bulk up your mu muscles because it ends up, um, affecting you negatively on the bike. Yeah. So I try to be, you know, lean muscle mass, which is great. But when it comes to my workouts, I usually try to take a rest day before do more of like an active recovery, like, um, walking or a stationary cycle, something that keeps the body moving, but less, um, impact or less, uh, resistance on the muscles and same for the day after I just need a day to recover. So with, uh, like I've been looking at your sexy athlete bundle, with something like that, how would I work that around my own schedule and my priorities with riding or just I, with any sport in general? I actually wouldn't recommend that for you. I would actually recommend MAPS performance based off of the things you're into, like motocross and the fact that you're already smart enough to be doing like these active recovery days leading up. And I would do mobility days. And I would only train one to two days a week of the foundational days from performance and then the mobility days. Yeah. Uh, so the performance is structured where you have three full body workouts a week. Okay. Um, but I, depending on how much motocross riding you're doing would depend on whether I do that one time a week, two times a week, or three times a week. How many days a week are you doing motocross? I mean, during the week, one at most, and that's usually on a Wednesday or Thursday, we have to wait for a track to be open. On the weekends, I try to r ride both Saturday and Sunday, and one of those days is usually like a, a race day, a performance yeah. one, day. One, one day a week of strength training. Yep. That's all I would do. I, I, I've trained a couple motocross uh, riders. Very demanding. A lot of people don't realize just how demanding that is. Absolutely. Yeah, one day a week of strength training, and yep. I would pick a MAPS performance uh, foundational workout. That's it. No more strength training. It's going to be too much to add to what you're doing. And it'll, it'll be enough to get you strong, keep you fit, give you what you're looking for to help you know improve your performance with motocross. More than that will probably be too much. Mobility, you can do as much as you want. Though. That's right. The mobility you do on all the other days that you you can work out. So, in, so you only have one day of really focused on strength training and then the rest of the days that you can make it to the gym and it's feasible or even yeah. to your living room for that matter. Uh, follow the mobility days and literally follow the mobility days to the T, like basically following the program. The only difference on how we would modify the program is like Sal saying, instead of doing three foundational days a week, you would just do one. A week. Now, because you're doing, you said Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday for motocross. Yeah. And obviously the weather affects it. If it's raining and we can't ride, I might only get to ride on the weekend or something okay. like that. But yes, generally the, the day that I would do the strength training would probably be Thursday. So I know you want to have a day before and after, but that's kind of impossible to do with Wednesday and then Saturday and Sunday. I would go Thursday and then, uh, you know, Monday, Tuesday mobility, because you're coming off two days of motocross, uh, Friday mobility, and then Saturday, Sunday, you do your motocross. So Thursday would be the day I would do the strength training. Um, and again, pick that workout for maps performance. Okay. And then let's say, you know, like I mentioned, it rains and I don't get to ride during the week. Is it okay to do two days yes. of yep. the... Yep. 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 And that's how I would decide that is based off exactly that is if this is a week where you didn't ride as much, go ahead and do another foundational totally. day. And you, again, listen to your body, right? So you, you will have, uh, you will know better than even we know. We're kind of guessing that will be good for you. But if uh, you go to two and you actually still feel really sore in your riding or you feel like it's hindering your workout, mm -hmm. then back off to one. If you're doing one and you're feeling great and you want to try two and you still feel great doing two, then go two. Okay. I'm just, I'm a very small female and I ride a full size dirt bike and I have noticed Im immensely how much of a difference it's made with my riding, just being strong and yeah. oh, having yeah. the endurance I have. So I'm, I'm just ready to, to keep that up and I guess sort of take it to the next level. So Excellent. definitely appreciate your guys' thoughts there. Excellent. Thanks for calling in, Ashley. And we'll send you mass performance. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You guys have a great day. You, you too. too. Have a good one. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you what, if you, if you do a general study and you look at sodium, 
So salt intake, sugar intake, and fat intake, you will correlate all of those to obesity, inflammation, and disease. Why? Salt, sugar, and fat are the key components of palatable, hyper-palatable food. Right. So it'll also show, which you have to control for, and this is the problem with studies, is they don't know what to control for, then they don't know what to control for. But what you would do with that is if you saw salt, sugar, and fat, is you'd say, oh, they must be eating a lot of heavily processed foods, which means they're probably also eating a lot of calories. And that's why, for example, sodium has gotten connected to poor health in mm. the past. Now we know with lots of controls, it's not that way, right? So- um, and you see now, you know, and it's really easy, by the way, to sell books and to, yeah. you know, to, to cause a, a lots of alarmists out there. Yeah. And be like, oh, it's this cut this out. And sometimes it's true. Usually it's not, though. And carbohydrates, we've been consuming like humans have con been consuming carbohydrates, fats and proteins for thousands of years. And there's cultures where people live a long time and they eat a lot of carbohydrates and, but their calories aren't very high and they're still active. And that's the yeah. key. I mean, generally speaking, I usually try to, uh, just because it's, it's, it, it's something I've noticed with all my clients, ha like they shared it in common whenever they would uh, get in a rhythm of, of incorporating dessert or like yeah. something that has like a lot of sugar in it. It, it, the, what followed that was more calories would just introduce themselves into the daily routine. Totally. And so it's, you just got to pay attention to these patterns of behavior. And if that's one of your foods or if it's like salt and it's always chips and it's something yeah. that you're con constantly consuming and just adding, you know, mindless calories and you're not getting a lot of nutrients from this type of food, it's something to evaluate. This is why I actually don't like to put a lot of parameters around carbohydrates and fats for clients. Like I, I like to go, Figure out what my client needs calorie wise. Yep. Hit figure get, out their protein intake. Yeah, get your essential fats. Yes. And your protein. And, and then as long as the only parameter I have around fat is making sure you get a, a minimal around of fat, right? So right. making sure you're not below what's healthy. And then I let you kind of yeah, go more back. More fat, more carbs. Yeah, and and mm -hmm. I and I actually encourage the client, like, hey, how about this week we we focus on a, a lot or a lot higher fat intake and lower carbon intake, keeping calories all the same, just manipulating those two macros. And then next week, let's do the reverse of that totally. and then assessing how did you feel? How did you like it? Was mm -hmm. it easy to follow? Yep. Was it easy to make the meals? And then I'm taking that information and based off of their feedback and what they're what they're telling me, that's how I'm going to manipulate whether we're going to run a more carb-heavy diet or a more high-fat uh, diet. And I think to me, that is the the better approach with, with someone or a client like this. Yeah, no, exactly. I do the exact same thing. And you know, with myself, it has it revolves a lot around gut health. I, if my gut health is not that great, lower mm -hmm. carbohydrates tends to work better. Mm -hmm. But if my gut health is great, higher carbohydrates, I get better performance. I get better strength. That's me personally. Right. So I a hundred percent. How did thing. you know? How did you know she was talking about Gary Tobbs? It's in her. It's on the notes. It's oh, her, I was yeah. like, damn, how did you, <laughs> yeah. you guys nailed that. I'm like, how did you know that? Yeah, yeah. I, didn't hear, I didn't hear her say it. <laughs> you just read her mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I have those special He's powers. the one on, that was on Joe Rogan, and I know yes. Lane Norton came after him. Yeah, and Lane someone, always goes after yeah, him. Yeah, Lane likes to go after him hard. But yeah. I mean, some of the stuff he, I've seen a lot of his stuff. Some of his stuff is. He's he, an investigative journalist. Yeah. yeah. That's what makes him. Yeah. So that's what makes that's why him people try so to tear apart. popular, though, yeah. is yeah. that there's truth in some of the stuff that he says. No, the investigative journalist journalist I like is Max Lugavere because he really does a good job of looking at data, mm -hmm. breaking it down, looking at controls and not being, you know, such an alarmist. And, and by the way, people love right. to just discredit somebody like that because they're not a, you know, they're they not- They didn't a, go through the conventional PhD program. Yeah. And I don't think that's fair at no, all no. because they, they like a Max Lugavere, they could be more red than yeah. some of the nutritionists that are yeah. out it's there. It's just so there's studies that compare literally the same calories, low carb, high carb. What happens at the end? Very similar, very, very similar. Fat loss, health parameters, blood markers change. The individual variances are what determine, you know, which one's better or not. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have someone with like early stages of dementia, you know, a ketogenic diet might actually be good for them right. with, with cognition. Is that true for somebody without dementia? No, usually you don't see that much of a benefit or any benefit. So it, the individual variance is where things can get kind of weird. But when you look at generally speaking, um, no, it's not true that carbs uh, are the devil. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal.